551 Gallifrey It took less than three days for the doctor to get everything ready. After Edward checked everything, they began the plan. Clara placed a device on her head and closed her eyes. Concentrate you only need to constantly think about reaching Gallifrey, said Edward with a reassuring voice before looking at the doctor. The latter had his own device, but it was a bracelet on his wrist. Let's begin. The TARDIS shook slightly, and each had a screen before them. They saw the TARDIS hurling the floating city, traveling through these blue corridors in the time vortex. Another part of the screen showed them countless data. She has accessed my timeline, said the doctor, surprised by how easy that was. This fact only proved that Edward was telling the truth and was deeply interconnected with Clara. Clara, what do you see? I see, me and different versions of you. Young, middle-aged, handsome, ugly, and even a woman exists. Woman? My next regeneration is a woman? Bloody hell, this should be interesting. Edward looked at him and did not explain. The current doctor has not gone to Trenzalore and received another round of 12 regeneration. As such, he believes his life will soon end with his next regeneration. Clara, focus. Follow the doctor to a time of a major war, that's our destination, said Edward. War? There are a few too many to count. Go for the biggest one you see. Oh, okay, she said as her face concentrated. Boom, the TARDIS shook so intensely that everyone flew from their position. Edward acted swiftly as his boot magnetized, sticking him to the floor, he even had time to create a magnetic shield around Clara. With his athleticism, he remained on the spot, but it was not the same for everybody else. The doctor was relatively fine, his Gallifreyan physique was stronger than that of humans. However, Clara was bleeding in the nose despite Edward's actions. Are you alright? Yes, thank you, no problem. Edward looked at the doctor, what happened? Lucky we took preventive measures, said the doctor, looking at Clara's fading pale complexion. His eyes then shifted to the screen. The time war is a fixed point in time, so it's protected in the vortex by an immense amount of time energy. Normally, it would be impossible to travel to that era, but since we're only using it as a mode to reach the Gallifrey pocket dimension, we can come close. So, the turbulence is our direct confrontation with all the time energy. Correct. Okay, let's continue. Is everything still operating? Ms. Oswald, how do you feel? I'm fine. I can continue. Our system has no problem, added the doctor. Let's proceed. Ms. Oswald. Call me Clara. All right. Clara. Focus on our destination. The TARDIS and its companion traveled through the vortex for a brief period before hitting something. It tried to pass with incredible difficulty. Arg, yelled Clara as she held her hands. Clara. 2x. Her mind cannot bear breaking through the dimensional wall of Gallifrey, commented Edward beside her. Didn't you prepare for this possibility? Yes, TARDIS, yelled the doctor, and this weird orange light emanated from the TARDIS and entered Clara's head. She stopped screaming and opened her eyes. Are you alright? asked Edward. I, I'm fine. Do you want to stop? What about your plan? she asked. Now that we're here, it's only a matter of using extreme means to enter. It's okay, I can still continue. Are you sure? Are you worried about me? she asked with a beautiful smile. Of course. Since I promise nothing will happen to you, I intend to keep my word. Only because of this, said Clara underneath her breath. Of course, Edward heard him, but he did not mention it. Soon afterward, they broke into the dimensional wall with Clara's effort and the protection of the TARDIS core. Golly Frey, said the doctor in a voice full of awe and reminiscing after walking out of the police box. While he was in a daze and Clara was looking everywhere, Edward had a screen floating before him that only he could see the content. Morgana, how is it? I already scanned the entire planet and found the places we wanted. That's good. Let's go, he said to the group. They soon found themselves in a city, but everything was frozen in time. The people, the animals, the flying ships, and even the buildings seemed static. I'm going to the central hub to get what I want, said Edward, stopping the sightseeing mood. Once I'm done, you can decide whether to unfreeze or release them. I don't think you need my help for this. No, I'll be fine alone. Edward went to the central hub, where most of the data on Gallifreyan's technology was kept. Normally, this place was of the highest order of security, but it was now very easy to get into. The only trouble was retrieving the data during the time stop. Edward did not waste time and used his time authority to speed up the process. Afterward, he traveled around the planet where core databases were located and took everything. One of his priorities was the technology of the TARDIS, and he took all of them in the museum, from the first generation to the latest TARDIS. Once he finished, he returned to the group. Have you decided? Give me a little more time, he said, and Edward did not rush him. He returned to TARDIS while Clara followed the doctor. In the next few days, they will return before going out again. More than a week later, the doctor finally made his choice. He would unfreeze Golly Frey but would not free them from their prison. He believed the return of his people was not good for the universe. Edward looked at him and did not say anything. As long as the Time Lords regain their mobility, they will definitely try to escape this prison. The doctor did not meet anyone from Golly Frey. Through the TARDIS, he unfroze this dimension before leaving. Are you sure you cannot stay? You could travel with us for a while, asked the doctor. That's a terrible idea. Edward shook his head. Although we have many things in common, we have even more differences. A short voyage is fine, but not a long one. Plus, like I said, I have people counting on me. I can't say long. 
Will we see you again? Asked Clara. I'm afraid the chances are low. Once he has processed and analyzed the acquired data, he will leave for his next world immediately. That's a shame. Edward smiled as he looked at her. I hope you found your purpose in life, and I wish you fulfillment in all your endeavors. Thank you, and I hope you can save your people. She gave him a hug before Edward focused on the doctor. They shook hands firmly. Any words for me? Yes, nodded Edward. Now that you've dealt with Golly Frey, I hope you can stop running from your past and find peace. River Song is a great woman who deserves more than you gave her. You're maybe right. They hugged tightly before Edward entered Netheril, rushing into the sky and disappearing. Are you sure you want to leave? Asked Morgana. This world has a lot of potential. I know, but it's best not to have too much interaction with someone like the doctor. Edward would not be surprised if the doctor one day developed omniversal travel and one day reached his home world. In this stage of his development, it's best not to deal with these kinds of people. Let's analyze our loot on this trip, said Edward with a smirk. I love how your thieving days are far from over, even after so long. Edward blushed as he remembered his youth, traveling the world and infiltrating places like the Vatican to steal books. What do you know? It's all for the pursuit of knowledge and truth. Whatever helps you sleep at night, but I know you enjoy the thrill of it all. Shut up and show me what we got. 552 Time Lord Technology Harry Potter, Dimensional Wizard by Lazy Sage Deo Edward did not leave the universe and hid somewhere to analyze the data he had just acquired. With Morgana's help, he swiftly categorized things and focused on the more important information they had. Edward began with the course Cosmic Science and Higher Dimensional Physique, one of the main cores that all Golly Frey who wish to become Time Lords must pass. With this course, Edward was able to see the evolution of the Time Lord's understanding of the universe and time from their infancy until the peak of their powers. Hugh, that was a lot, muttered Edward as he finished. He he, chuckled Morgana. What is it? Although you never admitted it, a part of you always believed magic was superior to science and technology. Now, can you say the same? Edward smiled in embarrassment as he knew she was right. The Time Lords have truly pushed the boundaries of science and technology. A perfect example of their accomplishment is the dematerialization gun, a weapon that can erase people from time, making them feel as if they had never existed in the first place. He could only do such a feat after controlling time rules. Furthermore, the dematerialization gun was not the only method the Time Lords created to manipulate reality and erase a person from time. Once we finished analyzing this universe's data, science, and technology in the Empire will almost catch up to magic, commented Edward. That is true, nodded the little elf before continuing their work. Their next focus was on the TARDIS and its engineering marvels of using time energy. Edward learned many things in the process, even making great strides in understanding and applying time rules. As soon as he finished, he began to work on Project OMN Gate, or his attempt to create a gate or portal that connected two universes scattered in the void. Edward's path will not follow the Magus and leave the astral universe for the void. Instead, he will open portals to other universes while keeping his original one as the main base. As such, he needs high-level technology that can bypass the danger of the void. This project was nothing but words on paper for many years with little to no development. That changed after Edward got his hands on Rick Sanchez's portal gun, and he made great strides. His idea is to create a portal liquid that combines Rick's technology with void energy, allowing him to navigate the infinite void like it was his back garden. After studying the development of TARDIS's technology from the earliest prototype to the nearest novel, he had new ideas to try. The void portal liquid he will create might function similarly to the time vortex by creating a unique time tunnel or void tunnel between two universes. This could work, said Morgana as she looked at the new development of this project. But it's not enough. Yes, but it's good as long as we make improvements. Edward was confident he might succeed after this time tour he was going on. What's next? The Time Lord's biology, explained Morgana before showing him a blueprint, and Edward's eyes soon focused on them. They are truly the definition of a time race, said Edward excitedly. The Time Lords can look into the past, present, and future through the time energy weaved into their DNA and every cell in their bodies. They have a terrifying immunity to time stop and any temporal-related anomalies. More importantly, they can change fixed points in time, making them a causality. Not to mention their ability to regenerate as a way to heal, granting each Time Lord 12 lives. These Time Lords are true Time Lords, commented Morgana, and Edward understood what she meant. Time Lords can alter a timeline instead of creating a new one in their universe. All the Time Lords in this universe have this ability. If my guess is correct, these Time Lords are immune to the rules of the Time Guardian, commented Edward with envy. There is no need for envy, we have their life code so that we can copy. True. Add them to the ultimate magic body, nodded Edward with excitement. Once he creates a perfect way to break the soul limit, he can condense his ultimate magic body, thus acquiring one of the best magical talents in the Omniverse. Okay, but we have to deal with the issue of regeneration. The flaw in the Time Lord's regeneration is that they will acquire a new face and new personality. The regeneration process changed their DNA slightly while also altering the chemicals in their brain, hence the change in appearance and personality. We should have absolute control over our bodies so the problem won't be an issue. However, there is the possibility that the process affects the soul. Edward did not think the Gallifreyan could not deal with such a simple issue. 
This universe's law of physics does not deal with the soul but the brain. However, he was different and needed to prepare for this eventuality. Let's run some tests, said Edward, and they immediately experimented. The result was similar to the Time Lords in the universe. The clones did not change appearance because of the mana and aura inside their bodies. Their soul changed, which led to a change in personality, commented Edward. Even their mana imprint changed. What's the reason? He had experimented on the relationship between time and the soul, and such an anomaly should not appear. Time is living, suddenly said Morgana. Are you saying time in this universe is a living creature? Not exactly, but more along the line, it has a slight consciousness. So, during the regeneration, the consciousness will affect organic matters, including the soul. Do we have time energy from our universe? Yes, but they should have been corrupted by the laws of this place. Try it and see. The experiment proceeded, and the result was the same. However, Morgana was proven to be true. Edward grunted as this experience was a lesson to learn. In the future, they would not allow everything they brought to a new world to adapt so that they could do experiments like this. Let's wait until we leave to continue this experiment. Okay, so, what's next? There are still a few things to do, Edward commented before proceeding to the next step. They stole Darlac's technology, which was on PAR with Time Lords. If the Gallifreyan's technology was based on space and time, the Darlac's tech was based purely on destruction including the eradication of space and time. He stole from the Cybermen, who were the pinnacle of robotics and cybernetic technology. He took a sample of the creature known as the Silence, who had a natural talent for memory wiping and hypnosis. Finally, Edward made a great effort to capture Weeping Angels, one of the scariest races in this universe. One touch by these statues looking creatures will send you back in time while feeding on the time energy of the life you could have lived. He was interested in their ability called quantum locking, which turned them into statues as long as someone looked at them. He believed if he could harness this ability, it would be perfect for his assassin squad. Imagine a group of assassins that were invisible as long as you looked at them. Although it sounded like a normal invisible spell, it was more. In the magical world, there were many ways to look at someone including through fate. This ability would work on all of them. Once that was done, Edward hopped in his city and proceeded to his next destination. 553 Anomaly Edward and his team soon arrived at their destiny with no issue, or so they thought. As soon as they entered the new world, everything spun even worse than the first time. What's going on? asked Edward. I don't know, replied Morgana before running more diagnostics. The process lasted longer than expected, and it wasn't until everything stopped spinning that Edward received an answer. Well, what was it? This universe seemed to be shaking and moving. Moving? How is that possible? He knew his destination, and this place should be very safe especially for someone of his power level. Did the universe suddenly acquire consciousness and become a living creature? He asked after thinking about their previous experience. It appears it's not the case. Edward grunted. Small accidents kept occurring, and he did not like this. All right. How are our systems? It appeared some of them were destroyed or malfunctioning. Are you serious? Even the previous chaos in the void did not damage any of the city's systems, so how could entry into a universe do such damage? What's going on? Edward asked before receiving an answer, Morgana continued, Boss, we are surrounded. A screen materialized before Edward and his pupils shrank, are those Amazonians. Many women dressed in armor, holding cold weapons, and some on horses surrounded the city. His gaze focused on one woman with long black hair, she was beautiful, regal, and full of power and charm. Wonder Woman. He was sure it was her as his memory of a particular animated movie popped into his mind. Before his reincarnation, Marvel dominated the box office while DC was supreme in the animated movie department. They had a new rebooted Justice League animated movie, and this Wonder Woman resembled that version. Can someone tell me what is going on? His destination was the Flash TV universe, which was only the CW universe. His purpose was to study the Speed Force, another manifestation of time. As such, Wonder Woman should not exist in that universe. I don't know either, replied Morgana, and Edward exhaled deeply. He closed his eyes to contact the Akashic record. Soon, he saw a customer service response from a small blue-winged elf AI similar to his. Sir, Edward, how can I help you? You people sold me the wrong coordinate. That's not possible. We would never make such an error. Then explain the situation to me, he replied, showing her the screen Morgana was displaying. The little elf frowned before saying, wait a moment before I open up your file. After a few seconds, she had an apologetic look. So, you did make a mistake. Technically, yes and no. What do you mean? The coordinates are the ones you asked for. However, a major change has occurred in the void recently. We should have sent you a warning but failed to do so. What major change? I'm afraid this is beyond your security level. You are the one who made the mistake, so you can repay me by answering my question. The blue elf paused for a few seconds, she seemed to be doing something. Then, she spoke. To answer your question, universes like DC and Marvel are experiencing an event called Convergence. Previously, many of the anime, films, and television you used to know were separate but connected worlds of the main universe the comics. But now, everything is fusing. It took every fiber and ounce of strength of Edward's body not to curse out loud. He had read the comics, so he knew how terrifying they were. The minimum power level was tier 12, and it might go as high as tier 14. 
With his measly tier 8 and even tier 10 floating city, he was nothing but a slightly large cannon fodder. Wait, my main destination for this voyage is the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Doesn't it mean that world is also screwed? He exhaled to calm down. What's going on with this convergence? Doesn't that mean the danger levels of these worlds are now much higher? Yes, not the point of exaggeration. The DC Universe convergence has just reached the late stage while Marvel is still in the early steps, so there is still plenty of time before the danger level of these worlds reaches the highest peak. Edward sighed in relief. As long as he hurries with his affairs in DC, he can rush to his destination and still take his time. He looked at the elf. Can you tell me how long before the process ends? Unfortunately, such knowledge is beyond your security level. Edward could tell she would not budge on this issue, so he did not insist and focused on something else. Since this was your error, are you prepared to compensate me? Of course. We have reimbursed your previous purchase. I hope our response is satisfactory. I am indeed pleased, nodded Edward as he sensed his knowledge points balanced increase. Well, thank you for your service. Wait a moment. Is there something else? You have a message from Sir Merlin, said the elf. Would you like to read it now? Yes? Hurry. Don't worry. I'm fine, I'm just busy. And grow faster, time is running out. Edward was first relieved the old man was okay. After not hearing about him for so long, he started worrying. Luckily, nothing has happened to him. Then, he sensed the ominous shadows behind these words. The previous sensation that he had all the time in the world was gone, replaced by a sense of urgency. Is this all, or is there something else? That's all. Thank you. Edward opened his eyes to a flurry of questions. Well, what did they say? Do you have a better understanding of the situation? And what's our next step? Edward grunted before explaining the situation to her. So, this world is indeed moving and expanding. Our sudden entrance must have disrupted the process and created a tide of chaotic energy that swooped us. Now, they finally understood the situation. What's next? You fix the damage to our systems, and I will deal with the people outside. Are you sure? These people hate men and should not be too friendly. I know, but if the situation is not dealt with swiftly, they could alert the gods in Olympus, leading to other problems. So, it's best to find a peaceful and diplomatic solution. I'll be fine I think. But what about you? This world is very accepting of magic, so we don't have to worry about adapting for too long. So, the only problem is fixing these damaged systems. All right, I'll leave everything to you. Edward walked out of the city with his hands raised. As soon as he appeared, countless spears, swords, and bows pointed at him. Easy, I came here in peace. A man? Why have you intruded into our territory? Asked Hippolyta, the queen of Amazon and Diana's, Wonder Woman, mother. An accident. My ship landed in this place by accident. Ship? Such a large city is a ship, asked Diana. Well, although a little flamboyant, but yes it's a ship. Edward saw her beautiful eyes light up, probably wanting to say a compliment. Alas, before she could speak further, Hippolyta spoke. You are now under Amazonian soil, so accept surrender before we discuss how to deal with you. Do not make any hostile moves. Edward frowned as he pondered. It would be easy to subdue these people, showing them he could have easily harmed them. But such an act might elicit a negative response. If it was only Diana, this could work. But with how Hippolyta is portrayed in different media, such a move might make her consider him a bigger threat and escalate the situation. Fine, let's allow them to capture me. Anyway, these people cannot harm me, and I can consider this situation as experiencing bondage after a long while. Edward placed his hands together to show his surrender. Hippolyta motioned for one of the Amazons to tie his hands. Edward secretly shook his head at how primitive such a move was. He thought they would use some magical artifact, but it was just a robe made with a unique material. Such a restraint was a nightmare for a normal mortal man, but nothing to him. Follow us, said the queen with a stern face. 554th Emissary Edward was in the middle, surrounded by all these Amazonians. Such a scenario where so many beautiful women surrounded him should have been his dream, but sadly, he was in cuffs. Well, I can see this as just some spicy stuff. Can you be any less shameless, sneered Morgana in his mind, but he ignored her. He looked around, taking in the sight and beauty. No one would believe he was a prisoner without his cuff hands. What a beautiful place, he uttered. The air is fresh, everything is natural, and I feel closer to nature, I haven't felt this way in a while. Quiet, you are still a prisoner, said one Amazonian as she used the butt of her spear to hit Edward on the back. Bang! His body generated a shockwave, destroying the spear and sending her flying more than five meters before crashing. Everyone pointed their weapons at her. My apologies. That's just my natural defense, it was not intentional. He was not lying as he did not expect the woman to attack him suddenly. If he did not respond swiftly enough, she would have been obliterated. Are you a god? asked Hippolyta with a stern face. Oh, no. On the contrary, I have quite the disdain for that term. Edward immediately stopped himself from talking about his views about godhood as he remembered the Amazonians in this world worshipped the gods of the Olympics. So, what are you? asked the queen. I'm an arcanist or a mage if you prefer. You can use magic? That would explain why your ship is a flying city? Diana commented. Exactly, replied Edward before looking at the person who attacked him. Do you want me to heal her? No need, replied the attacker as she stood up, only a few bruises showed she was attacked. She looked at him before returning to the line. 
Edward then remembered the Amazonians all had enhanced physical abilities. Queen Hippolyta looked at Edward, glancing at his tied hands before ordering everyone to continue his journey. Soon, they arrived at their destination, and Edward was still looking around like he was on vacation. The architecture of Themyscira was mostly Greek, with primarily white pillars, they added a touch of gold that symbolized the divine. Very beautiful, he commented, but no one attacked him this time. Hippolyta dismounted her horse before taking out her sword. With a swing, she cut off the rope binding Edward, who remained calm and composed throughout the situation. This will be your dwelling. Please do not leave without any instructions. After saying these words, she walked away, leaving a small group to watch the house. Well, things are better than I anticipated, thought Edward as he entered. He had things to do while he and the floating city adapted to this world. Besides repaying his knowledge point, the Akashic records gave him the coordinates to the timeline where the CW Flash TV was located. His original object was him, and he did not want to deal with the other Flash versions. He knew how terrifying Flash was from the comics and did not want to deal with them. However, despite having the coordination, he also needed to calibrate his landing so he would land in the early stages of that Flash's development. He had to be cautious for many reasons. Firstly, he knew the latter would become more powerful the older and wiser he was. Secondly, he only saw the first four seasons of that show and did not want to pay the exorbitant price that the record asked for him to learn about everything, and the knowledge Salomon gave him did not include the CW Flash. Themyscira, Council Room. Hippolyta sat on the main seat, surrounded by her most trusted advisors. How do you think we should deal with our intruder? She asked. Isn't it obvious? He's an intruder and a man, so we should eliminate him, said an Amazonian with golden hair and a voluptuous body. That's too radical, argued another one with a darker complexion and braids. We are not barbarians. This is not an argument of morality. The intruder's presence endangers the existence of the muscara. We have isolated ourselves from the world of men for so long. Do you want us to be discovered? Now, you're just using fear-mongering tactics. One person will not affect our isolation. You might be willing to take the risk, but I am not. Our default solution should never be violence. The two began to argue, but the queen never said a word. A little while longer, someone else spoke. A woman who was of Hispanic descent said, You two are always arguing and, as usual, failed to see the crux of the issue. And what would that be? Can we kill that intruder? You saw his strength and his magical city. Are you sure we can take him down? The blonde woman paused momentarily before continuing, He's only a man. I do not believe he can defeat all our sister's might combined and the protection of the gods. True, but what price will be paid for fighting with him? How many of our sisters will not walk out of such a meaningless confrontation? What will happen on the unlikely chance that he escapes and we have made a formidable enemy? All sacrifice is necessary for the protection of our home. The room quieted down, with all eyes now focused on the queen. Hippolyta did not say anything but asked another Amazonian. What do you think? You know what I will say. We. Forget it, she knew she had asked the wrong person and stopped her from spewing nonsense like forcefully breeding with the intruder to create more powerful sisters. And, in some comics, the Amazonians used sunken ships to forcefully have their way with marooned individuals before killing them. If the baby is a girl, they keep it. If it's a boy, they either killed it or returned it to the world. The queen's eyes finally landed on a petite Amazonian dressed not in armor but in loose white robes. Saren, what do you think? Saren calmly looked at everyone, we have lost contact with the gods. Everyone's heart secretly beeped as this was true. A while ago, they lost all contact with Olympus, not knowing what had occurred. As a result, the magical barrier protecting the island is rapidly fading. We will be revealed to the world of men in a few hundred years if the gods do not respond to us. No, the time might be shorter with the intruder's forceful entry. What are you trying to say? Isn't he a mage? We can ask him if he can repair the barrier and ensure its continuation in exchange for his freedom. This is a good idea. Not really. We will have to give the man access to our barrier. What if he breaks or controls it? We cannot take the risks. Another argument was about to happen, so Saren quickly said, My queen, what say you? Our main issue is trust toward that man. So, let's test him to see if he's trustworthy. While Edward was doing calculations, he received an uninvited guest in the middle of the night. You quite bold, said Edward as he looked at Diana. How so? Visiting a man in the middle of the night. A man whom you know nothing of and could be dangerous. As the mascara's greatest warrior, I think I can care for myself. True, nodded Edward. So, to what do I owe this pleasure? 555 demigod why are you staring at me like this, asked Diana with a slight frown. This seems rude. It's because I'm intrigued. By what? Your existence, replied Edward. What does that mean? Forget me for asking such a personal question, but is Zeus your father? Edward knew Diana had two origins, one was she was the daughter of Zeus and Queen Hippolyta, and the other was she was crafted from clay and blessed with divine power. That's correct, but is something wrong with that? She was also intrigued. I've met gods before and their children. Their divine nature makes reproduction completely different from humans, but there are still some rules. From my experience, four fates await a child born from a god and a human. First, they would die in the wound. Secondly, they will turn out into ordinary humans with no abilities. Such a phenomenon is extremely rare but does happen. 
Thirdly, they would turn into this abominations like creature whose very existence seemed vile and repulsive. Lastly, they will inherit powers from their godly parents' authority. I should belong to the third category, but why do you say my existence is an anomaly? Yes, you are, but I noticed a few anomalies from you as a demigod. You do not have Zeus's lightning powers. That should not be enough for me to be considered an anomaly, asked Diana. You're correct. Although I haven't seen a demigod without their parents' authority, it could be argued that you made up for this lack of powers with your overwhelming speed, strength, and invulnerability. The other anomaly is that you cannot absorb the power of faith, which is fundamental for the existence of any divine being. I can sense the divine power coursing through your veins, which is so pure. Is that a bad thing? No, on the contrary. Without the restriction of faith, you have unlimited potential potential that even the gods would envy. However, I could not help but wonder whether your creation was intentional or accidental. What are you trying to imply? Nothing, Edward shook his head. Knowing Zeus, I doubt he's capable of engineering such a brilliant idea. So, you're probably an accident no, not an accident, a miracle of the universe. You have inherited all the advantages of the gods without their weakness. Edward's eyes twinkled as he realized how unique Wonder Woman was. If he ever had to walk the path of godhood, he would imitate her situation and combine it with his knowledge of the elder gods in his world, who also do not rely too much on faith. You truly have no regard or respect for the gods, she asked with a frown. Oh, I apologize about that. I know I should respect someone else's culture and ideologies, especially in their home. Diana looked at him. She could tell his apology for saying these words to her, but the words themselves, she knew this man truly disdained the gods for some reason. However, she decided not to ask. I accept your apology. Thank you, replied Edward with a smile. Look at me. You came to for something, but I went on a tangent before you could speak. What can I help you with? I wanted to ask about how the world of men was. Are there many mages like you? Have they developed to such a level? Edward could see the curiosity and longing in her eyes. I'm afraid you will be disappointed if that's how you see the outside world. Oh, why is that? I'm from a different dimension where magic is everywhere, but in this place, magic is a rare thing practiced by a few. Is that so? She muttered. Wait, if you're from a different dimension, how do you know about my father? Have you been to Olympus? No, but he exists in my dimension. Well, a version of himself, lied Edward without any change in expression or remorse. That seems complicated. Do you not know anything about the world of men? Well, let me think. He secretly cast a spell to detect life in the nearest place to this island and read the people's minds. It's 1912? That means World War I will begin in two years. World War? Asked Diana. Yes, they are about to fight the largest war in history. You said one? As in, there will be a second one, hurriedly asked Diana. Yes, but that won't happen for another two decades. How do you know such information? As a dimensional traveler, I do not experience time linearly. Diana calmed down, thinking to herself. If the outside world was about to enter an era of chaos, she felt it was her duty to do something. However, she knew her mother would not easily allow her to leave the island. She looked at Edward and asked. Can you tell me about your travel? Sure, why not? In the next few hours, he talked about many of the things he saw and experienced, and Diana listened fervently. I did not expect the world to be vast and wonderful, uttered Diana, not hiding her longing. It is, and I'm sure you will have a chance to experience it. But now, it's late, and you should leave. You're right, nodded Diana as she saw the sun was about to rise through the window. Thank you for talking to me, she exclaimed before flying away. He looked at her, flying away before closing his eyes and continuing his meditation. Alas, not even thirty minutes later, he heard the sound of crashing around him before sensing something binding him. Edward calmly opened his eyes to see himself surrounded by many Amazonians with a robe tied. Your Majesty, I thought we had an understanding. We did, but before we can continue any form of relationship, we need to know whether you're trustworthy, replied Queen Hippolyta, holding the end of the rope. This should be the lasso of truth, he analyzed internally. Tell me who you are and your purpose in coming to our island. The lasso glowed golden, but nothing else happened. Edward calmly looked at it. When an interesting divine artifact, he commented calmly. I could easily replicate its ability to force people to tell the truth, but its indestructible nature is worth studying. It's not working, yelped an Amazonian. How is that possible, muttered Hippolyta before activating the lasso again. Tell me your origin. Don't waste your time, said Edward. In the hands of a truly powerful creature, this weapon might work on me, but not in your hands. He looked at the queen. I see. The gods have disappeared, and you want my help with your island's protective barrier. As soon as he finished, the rope fell on the ground as he had sealed the divine power inside. If you want my help, we can talk normally, on equal terms. There is no need for all this useless work. Now that he knew something had happened to the Olympic Pantheon, he did not need to be overtly careful when dealing with the Amazonian. Plus, he can use the time his ship is being fixed to get some benefit, like scanning Wonder Woman's life code and studying their other divine artifact. Who are you? Asked the queen, raising the highest level of alert in her mind. Like I said, I only crashed here by accident, replied Edward. And as you can see, if I wanted to harm you, no one could do anything about it even your daughter. The rooms became quiet for a few seconds. Now, if you don't mind, please leave my room. 
I will give you a few days to come down, and we can talk properly. I hope you have the right attitude by then. He waved his hand, and all the Amazonians were teleported outside. Then, the room repaired itself to the previous state, and Edward continued his meditation. 556 navigation system three days passed, and Edward did not stay cooped up inside his room. He would walk around the island during the day while continuing his calculations at night. During this time, Diana would come to see him and talk all night. Today, Queen Hippolyta finally came to see him. So, have you calmed down? Asked Edward calmly. We apologize for our previous actions, said the queen. Edward looked at her and could not tell whether she was sincere or was putting on a diplomatic mask, just like himself when dealing with certain people. It's water under the bridge, he said calmly. I will be direct, said the queen. What price do we need to pay for you to repair our protective shield? I only have two requirements, replied Edward, also choosing to be as direct as possible. Firstly, let my ship stay here until it's fixed. Secondly, allow me to study all your magical artifacts, especially the lasso of truth. Study. Yes, just study. That can be arranged, replied Hippolyta. Since the intruder was already here, it made no difference if he stayed a little longer. When can you begin? Tomorrow. He had just finished his calculations for the flash dimensions coordinate and needed to consult Morgana. I'll be waiting. Morgana, here are the coordinates. Okay, let me plug it in. A few seconds later, her voice rang in his mind again, it's not working. What do you mean? I'm not picking up any signal on that coordinate. How is that possible? Did I make an error in my calculations? No, I double-checked, and there were no problems, replied Morgana. Did the Akashic record give us the wrong coordinate? No, that's unlikely. Their whole brand revolved around knowledge and the truth, so it's unlikely they would make such a major blunder. Edward frowned, if not them, what is the issue? Let me run some deeper diagnostic, the purple-haired elf said before quieting. Edward did not hear from her until more than half an hour later. We might be in trouble. What did you find? Because this world is constantly merging with others, constantly expanding, finding the correct coordinate is currently impossible. A projection screen appeared before Edward, and he soon understood what she meant. It took too many calculations to deduce one timeline from the infinite multiverse with the constant space-time turbulence of this universe due to the convergence. And even if they could pinpoint the coordinates, Netheril was not equipped to navigate such a chaotic multiverse. So, we need a completely new navigation system, groaned Edward, who knew such a thing would take time, and that's the last thing he wanted. Knock, knock, come in. What's wrong? asked Diana. Although he'd only known this man for a few days, he'd usually be calm or smiling, but tonight, he had a deep frown plastered on his handsome face. The damage to my ship was more severe than I anticipated. Is that so? Is there anything we can do to help? I will ask if there is, replied Edward as he waved his hand to summon a table, tea, and dessert. Where did we last leave? Before we begin, I wanted to apologize for my mother and the clothes actions, they can sometimes go overboard when it comes to protecting the island. I don't blame her since I'm also a ruler in my dimension. So, I understand the need to do whatever is necessary to protect my people. Yes, you did mention that, but you never elaborate. How about you tell me more about your dimension? Sure, why not? Edward then told her about his rise from school to the creation of the Arcane Empire and its latest accomplishment. Such a wonderful world, such a legendary tale, muttered Diana. She knew even if Edward glorified or glossed over some detail, she could tell how much he had experienced. I did not expect you to be such a womanizer, she commented. One of my few flaws, replied Edward calmly as he sipped his tea. It's late. Indeed. I will see you tomorrow. The next day, Edward immediately worked on the island's protective shield. Dealing with was simpler than he anticipated. The reason for its weakening was that the gods no longer provided divine energy to sustain the shield, so he only needed to create a device that would allow Diana to use her divine power as an energy source. The entire process only took two days before being resolved. After seeing how swift and efficient Edward was, Hippolyta did not go back on her word and sent Edward all the divine artifacts the gods granted them over their long servitude. So, what do you think? asked Diana, who chose to accompany Edward while he was studying these artifacts. Hephaestus work. Yes, have you met him? In a manner of speaking, he replied. He indirectly studied forging from Hephaestus during his trip to the mummy universe. You don't seem impressed, added Diana. Besides the lasso, I can easily recreate any of these items and even make them better. Even though you're not a god and no divine power, I can turn any form of energy into divine power, including sunlight, casually replied Edward. So, magic is so magical. Most power systems are magical once you reach a deep enough level. Diana looked at these artifacts, what do you want me to do with them? You can take them away after I scan them. However, leave the lasso. Is it really so valuable? Asked Diana as she played with the lasso in her hand. Its ability is not unique, but its indestructible nature is worth studying. Of course, that is if it's truly indestructible. What do you mean by that? I have met a few things that made such bold claims. However, they've all proven that their indestructible nature was because they have never encountered a power great enough. So, we will see if it's the case for the lasso of truth. Diana took the other items away while Edward focused on his navigation system. He had a lot of work to do and very little time. Although he knew a thing like world fusion would take millions of years to finish, time is relative. 
Millions of years might be a few hundred years to him or only a few decades to someone else in another dimension. So, he needed to finish this project as soon as possible to go to his destination and leave this world. As such, he put the lasso in the back of his mind while focusing on creating a new navigation system. A week passed, and Diana flew to Edward's new hut located near the floating city, far away from the main area of the Amazonians. You're early today, he commented without raising his head from the screens before him. It was a training day. No one can give you a decent challenge. Sadly, no. Diana sighed before pausing and looked at him. You're strong, aren't you? Depending on who you're comparing me to. How about you become my sparring partner? Edward paused what he was doing and glanced at her. Fine, I needed a break. He stood up, and two swords appeared in his hand while a sword and shield manifested for Diana. I thought you were a mage. If I fight like one, you won't have a chance. Big words. Let's see if you can back them. Clink. The battle lasted more than an hour, resulting in Diana painting on the floor and Edward not having a single scratch on his body. Are mages supposed to be this powerful with a sword? If they are a good one, then yes. Diana shook her head. So, how do I compare? To whom? Some of the best warriors you've fought or met. Hmm, not bad. Only not bad. What can I say? Your attribute ranges from tier 4 and tier 6 based on my dimensions system. So, you're only not bad. What? Not satisfied. Can say that I am. Different dimension, different rules. How so? My dimension has a stricter and more hierarchical power system. People start at tier 0 and go upward after years of hard work and study. Meanwhile, in this place, a tier 0 human can acquire an artifact or cosmic power that grants them tier 10, 11, and even more power. I see. Edward could see she was still unhappy, so he continued, I can tell you you're one of the most talented individuals I have met regarding combat, even better than my wife, Olivier. The only thing you lack is combat experience. How do I lack experience? I fight and train with my sisters every day. I'm not talking about training, but life and death battles with powerful enemies. Diana immediately smiled wryly. Where would I have a chance on this island? Besides a few missions or events she participated in in Olympus, most of her battles were against her sisters. I can help you with that? A black portal appeared before him, and he took out a helmet. What is this? Virtual reality. You can think of it as a very real illusion where you can choose any opponents to battle. That's interesting. Diana did not hesitate to put it in her head and closed her eyes. Ten minutes later, she opened them with wide eyes. Where am I? Wasn't I decapitated? The illusion is too real so you will feel slightly disoriented. It will pass. As clarity loomed over her mind, she looked at the helmet excitedly. Can I let my sisters use it as well? As you wish. And, we should leave for the flash in the next chapter. 557 Leaving Edward had dozens of screens before him and countless papers and scrolls around him. Sometimes, he finds his mind more at peace or refreshing when writing on paper using a pen or pencil. Morgana suddenly appeared next to him. What was the result? The same, replied Morgana. The ship we sent was lost in another timeline and never reached the destination. Edward groaned. They've tried thousands of tests by now, but the result is the same the drone or ship sent was lost in the multiverse. Did we at least get some useful data? Yes, but nothing too big. Edward looked at the data and began to analyze and process the result. He was so glad he first went to the Doctor Who universe and learned about the time vortex and higher dimensional physique. Otherwise, he doubted he would get anywhere with the new navigation system. Despite his frustration at the situation and desire to leave this world as soon as possible, Edward slightly enjoyed himself because he found a challenge. Plus, the situation allowed him to process all the knowledge he acquired from the Time Lords completely and integrate them into his magic system. While deep in thought and focusing on his work, he sensed someone flying over, and he knew who it was. You seem in a bad mood, said Edward without raising his head. It's my mother. She can be so insufferable and stubborn, complained Diana. What is it this time? Your prediction was correct. A grand war is rapidly spreading in the world of men. Now that it's in its infancy, it's the perfect time to intervene and stop it. But she refuses to allow me to live, saying things like they were not prepared for my existence. What a bunch of nonsense. She's right, said Wang Wei casually. What? You're on her side. I'm not on anyone's side, I'm just telling you how things are, continued Edward. The world outside is not yet developed technologically and socially to accept your existence, especially since you're the daughter of Zeus. It would be fine if this world were the comics or a timeline where many heroes appeared as early as World War I since Diana's presence wouldn't catch so much attention. But now, she might cause more trouble than good. What do you mean by that? Do you know the main cause of war in the outside world? Not really, it's religion, answered Edward, multitasking with the screens before him. Despite the current level of technology, humans' desire for the divine has never stopped. So, what do you think will happen when Zeus's literal daughter shows up, displaying unimaginable powers? Diana did not answer, so Edward answered for her. First, people will be happy and celebrate, they've finally found concrete proof of the existence of God. So, they will search for proof from the other pantheons, and with their current disappearance, no one will find anything. So, they will reject your existence, claiming you're a fraud and a liar. But I am not a liar. Yes, but that does not matter, explained Edward. That's how human psychology operates. 
Diana thought momentarily, if what you said truly happens, I would not mind being labeled a liar if I could help the world achieve peace. Oh, no, things will only get worse from now on. I won't mention how most governments in the world will want to capture you to study your biology and try to replicate super soldiers. So, let's focus on the religious aspect. Currently, roughly one-third of the human population identifies as Christian, in other words, they are the largest and most powerful of the bunch. Meanwhile, religions like Hellenic paganism, which worships Zeus and other Olympian gods, are considered cults or treated as such by much of the world. Now, imagine what these people would do knowing the only proof of the divine in the world claimed she was the daughter of Zeus? They would use your name to rally more believers and spread their name, they would probably claim their pantheon was the one and only true religion. Isn't it easy to just tell the truth? The crux of the issue is it will be your words against many. You may tell the truth, but could the members of your delegation be willing to give up such an opportunity? They only need to secretly spread the news you're a kind individual who does not wish to cause more harm to the world, hence why you're saying this nonsense. I think you're being pessimistic, argued Diana. I can hide my identity and origin. True, but humans do not take kindly to the unknown. They will want to know where you came from and how you got your powers, replied Edward. You could lie and say you're an alien, but that would only bring up another issue. Is the human race ready to confront the fact they are now alone in this vast and dangerous universe? You could say your power is from some magical power or artifact you accidentally acquired in some unknown place. However, such a lie won't hold much when people do not find such powers or do not find any information about them in any country. My point is your involvement with humanity at this time is far from a good idea. So, you want me to wait while the world suffers. As cruel as this may sound, humanity must experience certain things before we grow and learn. The aid of any divine being is not a good thing in our early stages of development. When can I intervene? In a few decades. By then, threats we were unprepared to deal with will appear, and they will need your help. We will also have evolved enough to accept the existence of the divine without allowing it to crumble our society. By then, there will also be many heroes with strength and power that will share a similar mission as you. I understand. Diana stayed with Edward for a while but was distracted the entire time. Finally, she flew home as she needed time to calm down and think. A few hours later, Edward received another visitor. Queen Hippolyta, what do I owe this visit? Asked Edward while still doing calculations. I came to thank you, said the queen. It's sometimes hard to get through to her, so I'm glad you could make her understand. Your problem with communication is because you refuse to see her as nothing more than your little girl. I don't have any biological children, so I cannot comment on your unique relationship, but it's evident that if you could see and treat her as an adult, telling her even the harsh truths and reality, you wouldn't have many problems in your relationship. The queen was quiet momentarily before saying, maybe you're right. Time passed, and it was soon the year 1925. After more than a decade of trial and error, Edward finally created a navigation system that used an artificial time network to navigate this turbulent multiverse. Since the city was using its own time network, it was no longer affected by the chaotic space-time continuum of this world due to the convergence. He could find his destination even if these timelines constantly moved or changed. Can you not stay? Asked Diana. I'm afraid not. The Amazonian princess sighed, will I see you again? I have a place to go, but I will come see you before I return to my dimension. Then it's a promise. Edward smiled before a small wooden box appeared in his hand, my departing gift. You shouldn't have, said Diana, but she still opened the box to see a bracelet. What does it do? It allows you to convert your pure divine power into elemental divine power, lightning to be precise. Plus, it's also indestructible. Diana put the bracelet on, and with a thought, a bolt of lightning appeared in her, exactly like her father. So, you did figure out the secret of the lasso. Yes, a unique material blessed by the universe will. As long as the multiverse exists, the lasso won't break. Diana did not understand much of what he said, but she did not focus on that. So, you've successfully recreated it. In a manner of speaking, I link the artifact to your lasso. So, as long as nothing happens to the lasso, nothing will happen to it. I love it, she said. It's unfortunate I did not prepare one for you. How about this, I will return the gift when I see you again. All right, I look forward to it. Edward said his goodbyes before entering the city and preparing for departure. I thought you would try to trick her into going home with you, said Morgana with a look of derision. A few nights of romantic passion is more than enough for our romantic relationship. A woman like Diana would never allow herself to play second fiddle to anyone else, so there was no hope in the first place, anyway, he was satisfied with the few moments they shared together and made a great friend. Let's go. 558 The speed force Heil in invisible mode, the floating city landed in its destination. Finally arrived, sighed Edward. Quickly check what time period we are in. According to my calculations and data, the Flash is in its fourth year or season four. Edward grunted, so we couldn't land in his early years. We're lucky we could navigate such a troublesome multiverse, so don't expect to be able to land at any point in time, said Morgana. So, what's our plan? According to our simulations, Barry won't be as understanding or cooperating as the doctor. That's why I wanted to land early. We could have easily infiltrated Team Flash by working at Star Lab and get what we wanted. We have to adapt, so what's the plan? We don't know how much time before the convergence ends. 
So, let's use a more forceful yet still peaceful method. What does that even mean? Barry created an alternate reality in his third year when he traveled back in time and changed his mother's death. Although he left that reality, it should still exist. Our first visit should be there. Locate it. As you wish. Morgana could monitor the entire planet and the surrounding realities and dimensions connected to it. And even if she could not, she could use a cause and effect spell to find the reality connected to Barry. Found it, she declared, and the team did not hesitate to travel to that alternative reality. The process was not smooth despite the fact they were not navigating the multiverse. What did the scan find? Asked Edward. Barry Allen is not here, as we expected. However, oddly enough, I could not find Sevator as well. So, Barry was not the only one who escaped that reality, muttered Edward. So, is only Kid Flash left? Yes. Capture him. The process took some time and effort, but it was done perfectly. Edward looked at the young Wally West in this particular prison he made for Speedster. Show me the scan and preliminary result. The first thing they learned about speedsters is that it was impossible to read their mind or control them, and that's because the speed force was protecting them. Edward frowned at this result because he knew this was not an innate ability of any of the flashes. Gorilla Grodd has controlled Barry's mind on many occasions. After this preliminary result, he looked at Wally's life code, which was as the show revealed. Dark matter altered his cells and DNA, allowing him to tap into a special force in the universe the speed force. He did not care much for the life code alteration, as his focus was more on the speed force. For his experiment, Edward used dark matter to alter a clone's life code to copy Kid Flash, creating his own speedster. Then, he ran multiple tests on the subject. This can be considered a failure, commented Morgana. Indeed. Although they created a speedster, the latter's connection to the speed force was subpar, thus preventing them from learning its essence. What's more, it's the same for this subject we cannot read or control their minds. Such an anomaly was worrying. So, what's next? Asked the purple-haired clone. Let's clone Wally West and see if there is a difference. The result of the experiment's second round was different, even by leagues. The clone had a deeper connection to the speed force, thus not only making him faster but also could use different abilities. However, when compared to the original, they were still not in the same league. Wally did not want to cooperate with this experiment despite the promise of his release, he did not even accept the threat to his family, which was out of character for Wally. So, Edward had to make it look like the dungeon holding him had a faulty system and allow him to escape. While running, he gathered all the data he needed before recapturing. We can now conclude that connection to the speed force is not just related to the body but also the mind and maybe the soul, said Edward. However, Wally's soul dimension and flame were normal. So, where is the source of their gift? Do you think the reason for our anomalies is because this is an alternative reality? Asked Morgana. This could explain some of the anomalies but not all of them. Do you have a better theory? I do, replied Edward. The speed force is also a living entity or has a consciousness, and it does not want foreigners like us to find its secrets. He should have thought of that since the speed force appeared to Barry in the form of his mother in the show. That could explain it. But what's with all these time-related concepts suddenly acquiring consciousness, complained Morgana. Suddenly? For all we know, it's always been like, but we accidentally uncovered two worlds with similar concepts. True, but let's watch out if the same thing happens in the next world. The two continued their research and gathered more data. Edward traveled to Earth-3 after a great effort to observe Jay Garrick, another speedster. In the comics, Jay Garrick was the original speedster, but his power came from a mutation of his genes. It was later reckoned that his power connected to the speed force. Edward did not interact with Jay in any form and only secretly observed and recorded. The final result is that Jay's connection to the force was greater than any of his experiments but still to a lesser degree than Wally's, let alone Barry's. Side note, in the comics, Wally West is the speedster with the deepest connection to the force, not Barry. Even in the show, it's hinted at as such, but since Barry was the main character, such a plot did not go far. We have enough data to work with for now, commented Edward before making a device that would grant him access to the speed force. In the process, he was able to prove some of his theories. A normal universe has four fundamental forces, gravity, electromagnetic force, and weak and strong nuclear force. However, there are other forces in this universe, including the speed force. You were right, said Morgana. The speed force can affect the space-time continuum using speed and movement. Such an application should be unique enough for the time game. Indeed, replied Edward as he tested out the final product. However, this is not enough. The speed force he could tap into was not enough to break the restraint of the space-time continuum, so they needed more data. It seems Barry is the key to our success, commented Morgana. Yes. In some ways, he's the child of the speed force. The group's next destination was not Barry and his group but the major villain of that year the Thinker. He was a man of unparalleled intelligence who had his brain mutated after exposure to dark matter. The Thinker was shocked after seeing Edward suddenly appear and stuttered incomprehensible that he was an anomaly and should not have appeared. Do you think we should have dealt deeper into the effect of dark matter on the life code? Asked Edward after analyzing the thinker's brain composition. Maybe, but you should consider how this world is different. The laws allow for people's life codes to be more malleable and changeable. In other places, dark matter will not have such a positive effect. True, nodded Edward. All right, let's go see our protagonist. 
An apology if there are some inconsistencies or errors with this arc. It's been years since I watched The Flash, and I only saw the first four seasons. So, I'm doing my best through research, but it's not the same. 29,559 government interference Edward, dressed in a well-fitted black suit, shoes, and a long blazer, walked toward a room where he heard chatters. From a distance, he could hear Team Flash talking about recent events. Last year, Barry had to enter the Speed Force to save the city and the world, forcing him to be stuck there. However, the team did not give up on him and tried to get him back. After a few failures, Barry opened a breach from the Speed Force and returned to the world. However, the breach released a large quantity of dark matter. Unfortunately, a bus full of passengers was in that area, and they were successfully mutated as a result. These metahumans have been the main source of their trouble for the past few weeks. Who are you? Asked Joe, Barry's adopted father and Iris's real father. He was the first to notice Edward walking in. Oh, you're all here, that saves me a lot of trouble, replied Edward with a smile. I'm Agent Edward Bones from the SDMV the Supervising Department of Metahumans and Vigilantes. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. He handed Joe his badge before walking to Barry, you must be the famous Flash it's an honor to meet you. Same, replied Barry casually, but anyone could tell he was saying it for the sake of politeness. What exactly is this SP? SDMV, explained Edward. Over the years, the world has experienced a rise in metahuman and vigilant activities. Previously, the US government ignored all of you because the good you did outweigh the bad, but recent events have made many people concerned. So, my department was established to facilitate a better relationship between vigilantes and the government. That's a nice way of saying you want to monitor us. You must be Iris West, love your writing, commented Edward. But you're correct. However, it's best if you don't see it in such a negative light. The program has just started, and you guys are the first test run. You wouldn't believe it, but some of my superiors suggested starting with Oliver and his team in Star City. Edwards shook his head, showing how absurd such an idea was. We do not need supervision, refuted Barry directly. I agree with Barry on this, added Cisco Ramon. The government having control over how superheroes do their job? I cannot fathom a better recipe for disaster, stated Harrison Wolfgang Wells. Harrison Wells? Shouldn't you be dead? Asked Edward. Let me guess, from a parallel Earth. Earth 19, and you're deflecting the issue. Edward smiled before looking at Cisco. Do you mind if I use your computer to show you something? Cisco hesitated for a moment before agreeing. Edward pulled out a report with a number highlighted in bold red, 22, 345, 976,898. That's the amount of money your team has caused the government since you started $22 billion in over four years. All that money comes from taxpayers. How is that possible? Chimed in Caitlin, the team's doctor. Every time you run so fast that you destroy cars, windows, or the insurance paid for people's cars and properties destroyed, or even generate earthquakes or even tsunamis during some of your battles all of these require money, and the government has been paying the bill. You cannot blame Barry for all of this, argued Iris. True, but it does not change the fact he's responsible for most of it, explained Edward. What exactly are you trying to get at? Asked Cisco. I will be direct. According to my orders, your team has three choices, disband and become regular citizens, pay the money owed, and you can continue your vigilante activities, or, I suggest you choose that one, accept the supervision. Edward looked at Harrison Wells, personally. I suggest you pay the money. Many people are interested in the technology to navigate parallel dimensions, the benefits are simply endless. Impossible, denied Cisco, and Edward shrugged. And what if we don't comply, asked Barry, staring him directly in the eyes. You guys don't seem to grasp the severity of the situation, sighed Edward. Many people fear that Barry or one of his speedster little friends will one day travel to the past and eliminate the founding founders, thus erasing the birth of this great nation. Now, can you imagine what the US government which has the greatest military in the world will do to prevent such an event from occurring? Edward looked at him back, in such a worst-case scenario, you might be fine, but that cannot be said for the others. Are you threatening me? No, I'm trying to make you see the reality. What reality? Barry would never do such a thing, added Joe. One thing I've learned in my life is that fear is never logical. And when people with the power of a nation behind them began to act out of fear that's a recipe for disaster. The room became gloomily quiet for a few seconds before Edward continued, I understand this is a lot to process. I will give you a day to mull it over. I will be back tomorrow at 1,500 hours. Edward took his badge from Joe's hand before walking out, and the team immediately began to discuss countermeasures. What should we do? Asked Caitlin. Let's check that weirdly named department first, said Iris as she used the computer. Dad, do you remember his ID number? Yes, I memorized it. Soon, the team found Edward's identity, including the semi-classified ones. Ex-Special Force, served two tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. He was about to retire but was called into this new department, explained Iris. So, he's legit, asked Ralph Dibney or the elongated man, a new metahuman from the bus accident. He was quiet the whole time Edward was there. It appears so. You said he's an ex-special force and served, asked Barry. That's right. In that case, let's contact Diggle to see if he knows something. The team then contacted Team Arrow in Star City, asking Diggle if he had any information. A few minutes later, they received a call. 
I got news from a few of my contacts, said Diggle. Edward Bones led a task force called the Silent Diplomats. Their mission was to enter hostile territories and negotiate all kinds of under-the-table deals for the government. Diggle, did you hear anything about this SDMV? No. Apparently, this department was of the highest security level. No news was leaked before it was formed. However, I must warn you. From what I hear, Edward Bones is an expert negotiator, manipulator, and ruthless man who will do anything for his mission. Be careful how you deal with him. All right, thanks. No problem. I must go and deal with Olivier. He's not in the best mood after knowing the government knows his real identity. The call ended, and the room once again became somber. So, what do we do? Asked Ralph, but no one could give him an answer. Edward and Morgana looked at the screen before them. Are you sure you shouldn't choose a nicer identity? No, they are bound to be suspicious of me. So, it's better this way, makes it more believable. If you say so. What's our next step? Let's analyze the data we gathered. They could not read Barry's mind, but this was not the same for the other members. People like Caitlin and Cisco have been with Barry for a long time, and as scientifically minded individuals, they have a great understanding of the speed force. In their mind, Edward was able to gather a lot of data. From Caitlin, he learned a great deal about how Barry's cells and DNA reacted or connected to the speed force. Meanwhile, he learned about the force itself from Cisco's mind. After summarizing and analyzing the data, Edward showed up to the lab the next day, as he stated. 560 data and anomaly Edward walked into the room where the team was waiting, including Kid Flash or Wally West, who had recovered his power a while back. He smiled and asked politely, I'm assuming you've made a decision. No one answered him for a while before Barry said, what exactly will you do as our supervisor? We will first begin by taking data on your abilities, the ins and outs, lows and highs we need to know the extent of your abilities your limitations. For what? asked Barry. Isn't it obvious, chimed in Iris, to deal with you in the future. Once again, you're seeing this in a negative light, calmly explained Edward. We are just preparing contingencies in case something goes wrong. By then, we will have ways to neutralize the individuals involved without causing too much chaos. You have a way with words, you should write novels like me, sneered Harrison Wells. This version from Earth-19 was a writer instead of a scientist, so Edward reduced his threat level. Regardless, he was still being closely watched. What exactly do you mean by something going wrong? asked Caitlin. The worst case scenario is that Barry becomes evil and uses his powers for nefarious means. Barry would never do that, immediately defended Cisco. He has saved countless lives he's a true hero, added Iris. I am not attacking his character, continued Edward. We are just preparing for many possibilities. But it seems like you were, countered Joe. How many times has Barry risked his life to save this city? To save the world? Where was the government then? Now, you walked in here accusing him of turning evil. Calm down, said Edward calmly yet authoritatively. He looked at the team and said, all of you seem to have ignored the events of Flashpoint. The room immediately became quiet. In a moment of grief, he made a selfish decision to go back in time and save his mother, his actions altered reality as we know it. I have learned from my mistakes, argued Barry. I know the consequences of messing with time and would never do it again. Really, said Edward as he looked him in the eyes. Tell me you would not make the same choice if you watched everyone in this room die look me in the eyes and tell me you would not be tempted. I would never let anything happen to them. You didn't answer my question, Edward snapped back, so Barry moved his eyes away. Do any of you know the repercussions of Flashpoint? Do you think his actions only affected Central City or the people close to him? No, lives across the globe were affected. Government entities worldwide created special units to deal with the aftermath of Flashpoint, recording what was different from the previous timeline. How is that possible? Do you think you're the only one who can notice the changes in the timeline? The world is vast, and Central City is just a small microcosm. The room became silent as the previously built tension rapidly dissipated like a popped balloon. Now, turning evil is not the only scenario in which Barry could use his power for selfish reasons. Grodd's existence is proof that his mind can be controlled. If a metahuman with such ability shows up and we must face the Flash, the government wants to be ready. I still think it's a bad idea for anyone to have access to such data, added Wells. Especially the United States government or military. Maybe you're right, but at this point, there is no longer any room for negotiations, said Edward before taking his phone out of his pocket. My team is outside and will come in to begin the tests. After making the call, close to a hundred individuals walked into the lab and began setting up equipment pieces. Wait, we have to be tested too, asked Cisco as he looked warily at the man before him. You're a metahuman, too, aren't you? So, you are also on the list to be supervised, replied Edward while still on the phone. More than an hour later, everything was set up, and they began with Barry and Wally. They wore a special suit designed to monitor their heart rates and other bodily functions. Then, they used a specially prepared cosmic treadmill that allowed them to use their full speed. Edward calmly watched Barry, and when a portal appeared a few meters before Barry's treadmill, his eyes secretly lit up. The entrance to the speed force, he thought without any change in expression. The subsequent tests were his other abilities, like phasing through walls or releasing lightning bolts. The final test was to gather data while he ran through the speed force. However, Edward did not stay around as he pretended he was supervising the others. 
He watched Sisko using his power of vibrations and his reluctance to show his dimensional portals. Meanwhile, Caitlin showed her power to manipulate ice, and Ralph showed how his body could elongate itself. The entire process took more than six hours before it was over. See, it wasn't so bad, said Edward, and everyone either rolled their eyes. I will return in three days to proceed to the second step. The team watched Edward, and as soon as he was away, someone spoke. What a terrible experience, commented Wally. I think I'm developing a disdain for bureaucrats, added Caitlin. Something is wrong, said Barry. What do you mean? Iris held his arm, not hiding her concern. I have this bad feeling about this agent, he continued. Cisco, check our systems to see if there is any problem. I will check the entire building for any bugs. Swish, lightning flashed as Barry ran at unparalleled speed, searching every corner of the building. Found something? Asked Joe. No, nothing. Cisco, what about you? I found something, but... But what? It didn't seem like they wanted to hide that they were going to monitor us, he replied. Finding the hidden code in their system was too easy, and he did not believe these people were so incompetent. Let's talk in a more secure place, said Barry, and Cisco immediately opened a portal to Earth-19. What are they doing? Asked Edward, not moving his eyes an inch from the screens before him. As expected, they don't trust us, replied Morgana. That's to be expected, he replied casually. Today, he gathered significant data on Barry's connection to the Force and the Speed Force itself. Now, he was confident in creating a clone capable of running fast enough to enter the Speed Force itself. We have a problem, suddenly said Morgana. What is it? He finally moved his head away from the screen. The tracking spell we placed on Barry is gone after he entered the Speed Force. Edward frowned, tell me exactly what happened. I was receiving data but only briefly before something wiped it out. Edward grunted, what about the others? We still have eyes on them. Did Wally also enter the Speed Force? No, he's just waiting. Keep an eye on him and tell me if something changes. Time was running out, so he immediately began his work. He created a new clone and sent it to the Speed Force to help him gather data. However, a few seconds later, something happened, and the clone died. He summoned the recording from the latter's soul without hesitation right before its death. 561 Confrontation Rom the clone's memory, Edward saw what had happened. A black, undead-looking creature immediately attacked the clone after entering the speed force, the creature was extremely fast, and as soon as it touched the experimental subject, the latter disintegrated. Time wraiths, muttered Edward as he knew of these creatures. These creatures are similar to the time guardians in his universe, tasked to prosecute any speedster who time travels and messes up with the space-time continuum. Now we know for sure the speed force has a consciousness and is trying to prevent our works, commented Morgana. Do you want to use drastic measures and attack it? Are you crazy? Edward rolled his eyes. The speed force runs through the multiverse. In other words, it's a tier 11 entity, which might be the bare minimum. In the comics, speedsters have done many things that regular tier 11 could never do. And now that this world was being fused with the comic, who knew how powerful it was? So, what do we do? We will send as many subjects as needed. We can gather much data from their confrontation with these time wraiths, replied Edward. Plus, we still need Barry. Time passed, and Edward returned to the team, holding a metal briefcase in his hand. Everyone just looked at him, waiting for him to speak first. Wow, you guys are truly a bundle of joy, said Edward with a smile, only he and Morgana knew what was on his mind. Using legilimency, he knew these people were secretly investigating him but had not found anything yet. Sadly, he still could not read Barry and Wally's memories. The tech support team has a gift for you, said Edward as he opened the case. A new suit, asked Barry, not hiding his confusion. Yes. This suit absorbed the excess heat and kinetic energy you released when running. My suit already does this, he immediately said. Why don't you let me finish, said Edward, looking helpless. Not only absorb it but redirect the energy to increase your speed. According to them, your speed will receive a boost between 20 to 40 percent dot. Thanks, said Barry, but his face showed no gratitude or interest in this new suit. Edward did not say anything. Now, we can begin our work. We have nothing to do yet, said Cisco. This is not a job, and most of the time, the city is peaceful. Is that so? In that case, I'll be in my office. Edward stayed in his office for the next few hours, only leaving for lunch or bathroom break. Meanwhile, Barry and Joe attended their job at the police station while Iris continued her career as a journalist. Harrison Wells was absent, leaving only Ralph, Caitlin, and Cisco. The elongated man had a day off from his job, so he spent the day with Cisco and Caitlin. At 8 p.m. sharp, Edward walked out of his office and said his goodbye to Caitlin and Cisco, who only nudged their heads to acknowledge his existence. Then, they immediately reported to the others. We need to give them something to do, said Edward back in his hiding place. Plus, we can also prepare for the future. What do you have in mind? The next day, the team had to deal with a new metahuman. You guys seemed in a hurry, asked Edward as he walked in. A new metahuman, explained Cisco, and it's a speedster. How is that possible? That's what we are trying to figure out. Let me see. They showed him a video of a speedster robbing a bank, and Edward frowned. Why did he only take 5,000 dollar? Why does that matter? Asked Cisco. No, it does, chimed Iris. Such an act screamed desperation instead of a criminal mastermind. 
Are you saying our perpetrator did this out because they believed they had no choice, added Joe? Most likely. Then, we can start from there. The team soon began to work, trying to discover the identity of this new speedster. However, even with Edward's help, nothing was discovered until two days later when the latter struck again, stealing more than $50,000 this time. He or she is escalating after getting a small taste, commented Joe. It won't be long before things get out of control. We need to stop them. Then, the next day, they tracked the perpetrator while they were in the midst of committing the crime, and Barry rushed to the scene. Sadly, in his first encounter with this dark flash, as the media called this speedster, he failed to capture his opponent. Barry, what happened? asked Joe. With the new suit, he should have captured his opponent. He was not only a speedster but also had this ability to clone himself. He distracted me with the clone, and I lost his track. Time passed, and it has been two weeks since this new speedster showed up. Unfortunately, Barry has never succeeded in capturing his opponent, he did stop a few of the latter's crime attempts, but that's all. This speedster would display a new power in every confrontation, rendering the team's plans useless. Meanwhile, Edward was over the moon as he gathered almost all the data he wanted from his experiments and mainly from Barry's confrontation with the opponent he chose for him. Today was a Tuesday morning, and he walked inside the lab as usual. However, he immediately noticed something was wrong. From these people's memories, he knew Barry told them he discovered something about me but refused to say anything until I was present. He saw everybody staring at him, including Harrison Wells, who returned to this earth. Do I have something on my face? Or maybe on my shirt? Asked Edward as he checked his appearance. Enough with the charades, said Barry. Tell us who you are and what your true purpose is. Excuse me. I saw what you did to Wally in the alternative reality I left behind and all the other cruel experiments, said Barry with gritted teeth. Interesting, uttered Edward. So, the speed force directly contacted you? I should have expected this after what happened last year. So, you're not hiding it. Since the truth is out, what's the point of doing that? Barry controlled his emotions, are you going to answer my question? Who are you, and what's your purpose? You can think of me as a scientist whose latest research topic is the speed force. The new speedster that's your doing, asked Iris. Correct. Since you can already create speedster, why must you infiltrate our team, asked Harrison Wells. I don't merely want to create speedster I want to create the speed force itself, replied Edward before gazing at Barry. Of all the speedsters in the multiverse, you have the deepest connection. Only through you can I truly understand the speed force to be the point of recreating it. That's simply impossible, persuaded Cisco. Maybe for you. I won't let you, said Barry. You can't stop me. Time suddenly slowed down as lightning encased Barry and Wally. He rushed forward with maximum velocity toward Edward. Do you think this was enough to stop me? I expected you to be a speedster, but this won't change anything, said Barry. I've got your back, added Wally. Edward only smiled before the two realized they were also moving in slow motion, the world suddenly felt very difficult to move in, like they were underwater. Then, Edward calmly walked to each of them and placed a bracelet on their wrist. Crash, Barry and Wally fell on the floor, and time began to move normally. Barry, Wally, Iris and Joe rushed to the two of them. What did you do to us? It's a simple seal that blocks your access to the speed force, calmly explained Edward before looking at Caitlin and Sisko, who were prepared to use their powers. With a single look, they discovered their powers were also blocked and became useless. Here is what's going to happen, continued Edward. 35,562 soft and hard threat in the next few days, Joe and Barry will be suspended from their job at the station. Joe will be for a pending investigation on an old case, and Barry for the mistreatment of evidence. Iris will be demotivated to a non-writing job for whatever reason. Your credit cards and bank accounts will be either closed or limited. The media will focus on this new speedster that is bent on committing robberies and other crimes, said Edward in a calm tone, ignoring the scared and confused look of the team. He tapped his hands, and a flash of lightning rushed into the room, showing the new speedster that Barry had been having trouble catching. Then, to the team's horror, the speedster removed his mask, and his face was the same as Barry's. They would have thought it was him if the original had not been lying on the floor. Edward looked at him in the eyes. If you cooperate with my research, I guarantee you will never see me again afterward, and you can return to your previous life as if nothing had ever happened. However, if you make things difficult, even the slightest. Edward paused, the story in the media is you became disgruntled after being fired and began drinking and gambling. Then, one night after a stay in the hospital, you acquire your powers. In need of money to live and pay your debt, you used your powers for crime. Believable story, isn't it? Asked Edward with a creepy smile. You should thank me for preserving your legacy as the Flash. He glanced at Iris, I know what you're thinking. The Dark Flash appeared a while ago, so it's easy to prove Barry's innocence. Unfortunately, you will discover that all records of his firing are from a few days before the appearance of the Dark Flash. Every individual involved in the situation will have vivid memories of that day and be able to testify that Barry was fired on that specific day. After saying these words, Edward calmly walked out of the room. To the team's sadness, things proceeded as he said. First was Joe, followed by Barry, then Iris. I have checked the Central City Main Hospital, said Iris, her eyes red from tiredness and worry. There are records of Barry staying in for an alcohol overdose. Apparently, one of the interns made a mistake and injected him with an experimental drug. 
So, that's how his powers will be explained. Yes, sighed Iris. It's truly scary. I talked to the nurses, the doctor, the receptionist, and even the hospital administrators. They all have memories of talking or treating Barry. And it's not him. Many people have heard of it since the hospital tried to avoid a lawsuit. The room quieted briefly before Cisco spoke, it's the same for the casino. Barry has a paper trail of his debt, and guess how much it used to be? $5,000, replied Joe. The same amount the dark speedster stole in his first crime. Bingo, said Cisco in a dejected voice. How are things going on your side? I tried talking to the captain, but it was useless, replied Joe. So, what do we do? Asked Ralph. He did not know how to feel about being ignored by Edward. Happy? He was since his life was not affected. Dejected? Also, he felt the latter did not value him at all and treated him as if he did not exist. Yes, what should you do? Everyone turned their head to the voice and immediately expressed anger and hatred. What do you want? Asked Barry. I never hid my desire, replied Edward. You help me with my experiment, and everything will return to how it used to be. How can I help you with that damn bracelet? You just need to be willing. Barry looked at his team before sighing, I'm willing. That's the spirit. Edward did not hesitate to link him and Wally to countless machines and collect data. Still missing something. You're right. Even if we only created a tier 10 speed force, we are still missing the key point nodded Morgana through psychic communication. Let's run a test into the speed force. Are you sure? That could cause problems. As long as his family's financial and social life is in my hands, he should know what to and not to do. Edward ran his test, and as expected, there were complications. The bracelet and all the other tracking marks he secretly left on Barry stopped working. What should we do? Asked Morgana. Since that thing loved its speedster, we will blackmail it with the life of one. What do you have in mind? We will put a powerful curse around Barry that is linked to Wally. If the consciousness tries to remove our marks or the curse, it will activate and kill the kid Flash. This might work. However, for a curse to work on a tier 11 entity, it must be unstable or volatile, highly complex, or versatile. But even then, it will only buy us a short amount of time. Not necessarily replied Edward. Although the speed force is a multiversal entity, it cannot use much of its power in one timeline. Hopefully, you're right. Edward immediately began concocting this curse, in which he mixed into all his learned or mastered rules. Over the past 500 years studying the soul limit, he made many accomplishments in mastering rules or rules. As such, he now wielded all elemental rules except light and darkness, soul rule, destruction rule, death rule, space-time rule, and curse rule. The final product of this curse was a black bracelet, which was finally completed after taking some of Wally's blood. Edward's plan worked as the speed force did not remove his marks, thus allowing him to gather more data. Things were proceeding smoothly for a whole month until Edward calmly watched Barry finish today's test as he walked out of a portal. This should be enough for today, right? Do you think I didn't detect your little movement? Excuse me, asked Barry, not showing any hint that something was wrong. The time remnants you send out, do you think I wouldn't find out? I have no idea what you're talking about. In fact, Edward did not see or detect when Barry created a time remnant since the speed force blocked his view or senses. However, the remnant who is something like a clone tried to traverse the multiverse, mostly trying to get help from other Earths. Sadly for this team, Edward had already used Rick Sanchez's technology to block this timeline. It seems that soft threats won't work, so let's do this the hard way. The team's heart skipped a beat. Then, before they could react, they discovered they were inside some kind of shield in space. Is this Earth? Asked Caitlin as she looked at the blue planet underneath her feet. They could not believe how fast they teleported outside of the planet's atmosphere. Beautiful planet, isn't it? Said Edward, his tone eerily calm. It would be a shame if it was gone. He pointed his finger to shoot a small purple energy orb. Boom, the entire planet exploded, and no one including Harrison Wells, who is usually calm and composed knew how to react. A beautiful yet cruel sight, uttered Edward calmly. 7.9 billion people died just like that. I'm, impossible, stuttered Barry. You're, a, monster. Calm down, there is no need to be so dramatic, he said, still eerily calm. He snapped his finger, and a large clock appeared. Its handle moved backward, and the team watched as the destroyed planet returned to its former state. Before the team could process what had happened, they were already back in the lab. Next time you pull another stunt like this, it will be permanent, said Edward as he gazed directly into Barry's eyes. He then slowly walked out, leaving them alone to process everything. 563 true hero me it's not true. Tell what we saw and experienced was a lie it was some kind of illusion, said Barry, walking back and forth. I'm afraid, it was true, uttered Cisco. No. My equipment is detecting high levels of residual energy, explained Cisco. Plus, I just checked the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, BIPM, and all the atomic clocks have detected anomalies, which would occur due to reverting time, finished Barry, who immediately became pale. The room entered an eerie quiet before Ralph spoke. I'm done. He immediately headed to the exit. Oh, calm down. What do you mean by that? Like I said, I'm done. You can't just leave, said Iris. Yes, I can. I reluctantly signed up to fight normal crime in this city and a few metahumans. But someone who can blow the world with a finger and revert it back as if nothing ever happened? That's beyond my pay grade. Come on, Ralph, 
persuaded Barry. I know things looked bleak, but we still have hope. Oh, what kind of hope? Well, we are alive, aren't we? That's something. Yes, because of his mercy. But if you continue with this kind of thinking, we won't be for long. No matter what the others said, Ralph walked out and did not stop. His departure dealt a great blow to the team's morale. I can't believe he just bails like that, complained Wally. You can't blame him considering the situation, said Wells. You're on his side. No, but I understand his choice. So, would you do? Enough, Wally, said Joe with a raised voice. Now is not the time to be fighting amongst ourselves. We must think of what to do. Unfortunately, no one could provide him with any decent idea. Edward showed up the next day as usual. He was indifferent to everybody and immediately forced Barry and Wally to undergo his tests. He was more severe this time around, as he would push them to the limit for three straight days before leaving. He would give them a potion to replenish their fatigue whenever they were tired. Then, he would disappear for one day before doing the same thing. By the second week, Wally became useless as his connection to the speed force was not deep enough for this level of research, so he no longer participated. We are still missing the last piece, said Morgana. However, we now have enough data to calculate the missing link. And how long would that take? 50 years. Do you want the exact number down to the second? No need, replied Edward. In hindsight, 50 years was not long, especially since they could use time dilation and not worry about time back home. So, what do you want to do? Do you want to use more drastic measures? Asked Morgana. No need. We can push Barry further and gather more data, this should reduce the time needed for the final calculations. As you wish. As soon as Edward walked into the room, he knew something was wrong he could no longer read the other people's minds, not just Barry and Wally. What have you done? He asked the speedster. You're too strong and must be stopped. Otherwise, this world could come to an end because of your whim. We were so close, Barry. My research was so close to finishing that you would never see me again. Why do something stupid? How do we know what you say is true? Are we supposed to believe your words? Added Caitlin. There is no need to talk with him, said Sisko, and the team immediately acted. An armor similar to Savitar materialized around Barry and Wally, but they were not the only ones. Every team member had similar armor. Sisko shot a few blasts in the air to open portals, allowing countless people to walk in. Edward first saw Oliver Queen or the Green Arrow, and all his team members walked into the room. Everyone had unique armor. The next to enter was Supergirl, Kara, who walked out, followed by her cousin, Superman, Clark Kent, and a group of superpower individuals from Earth-38. Following them was the Legend of Tomorrow, a group of individuals with a mission to preserve the space-time continuum. All the members had one connection to Flash or Oliver in some capacity. The last group to arrive was composed of speedsters. Edward immediately recognized the first person as Jay Garrick, usually known in the comics as the first speedster. He had to take a moment to recognize the other two. He did not watch all of the Flash but remembered specific videos online by accident or by choice of later seasons. So, he recognized the two of them, one was someone called Godspeed and should have been a villain unless he remembered correctly. The other one was Barry's daughter from the future. Edward calmly looked at the team, focusing on their armor. An armor powered by energy from the speed force itself? This must be one of Wells' works, he commented. His calmness unnerved me, said Diggle through their communication system. It's just a bluffing tactic, Oliver responded, not hiding his voice. However, Edward paid no attention to him but glanced at Barry. I'm curious how you put this team together. Does it matter? The unknown is eating me alive. Sadly, no one would answer him, so he had to cast a divination spell to get some answers. Over the years, he had made great strides in this field of magic that always eluded him. Plus, he's learned he can achieve way more if he lets Morgana do the divination instead of him. So, it was a time remnant, he thought. He believed he had captured all of them, but the speed force hid one and even sneaked it out of this blocked timeline. The remnant was the one who put up this time, and Edward even believed the speed force allowed it to access Barry's memories. He looked at Barry in the eyes, I respect you, Barry. Despite the despair you faced when confronting my power, you never gave up simply because you were a hero. Sadly, your foolish actions will cause you the death of everyone that you care about. But don't worry, I'm not as cruel as you would like to think I won't lay hands on this planet. Attack, roared Barry and Oliver simultaneously. Sadly, their attempt was useless. A shield appeared around Edward to block all their attacks. Moreover, everyone soon noticed their bodies were rapidly disintegrating into tiny particles. What have you done, roared Barry, but Edward calmly looked at him with no words. He had used all the power of Netheril to use one of his most powerful laws destruction. As such, despite all members of the team wearing speed force armor equivalent to tier 7, meaning they could survive the sun's destruction, no one survived this attack. The speedsters, Kryptonians, and Martian Manhunter were the last survivors. Their power or physiology allowed them to siphon more power from the force and delay their inevitable death. Alas, the pain of watching their loved ones die had almost broken them down mentally. You could have avoided this, said Edward with a cold and callous indifference. He pointed his finger at the speedster and forcefully drew out their soul flame. He did not care for their last look of regret, anger, and resentment. What are you going to do? Asked Morgana. Experience what it's like to be a speedster with the highest affinity with the speed force. It should hate us right now, so do you think it's a good idea? 
I only need to draw its consciousness into a battle with my willpower, this should buy us enough time. Since you've thought of everything, let's proceed. 564 weaponized. Edward floated in the air, legs crossed, and blood dripped from all of the offices in his face. Despite his gory appearance, he looked calm as the space around him twisted. His willpower was directly confronting the consciousness of the speed force while his mind and soul were navigating through it, gathering as much data as possible. With Barry and the other speedster's soul, the speed force was like his home, allowing him to navigate and understand its ends and out. The process was intoxicating as his mind ran at a speed unlike never before, he felt absolute freedom. Blurk. Edward opened his mouth and vomited a large mouthful of blood. A potion appeared before him, and he drank it. How is it? asked the little elf. Good, more than good, he replied hoarsely. So, we got what we wanted. Not only that, but my willpower has finally reached nine. Chris's meditation technique had previously improved his willpower, and this confrontation was what he needed to reach a new height. He could feel it as soon as he opened his eyes. The world was different, everything felt like it would be okay since he now strongly believed he could survive anything. Lastly, controlling his rules became way easier. That's good. Not only had her boss improved spiritually, but they could finally replicate this thing. The speed force had applications beyond just surviving the time game. By creating a speed force dimension as her core, her processing power can drastically be increased, finally breaching the previous barrier and becoming an entity on PAR with a universe will. By then, her calculations would be as if an infinite version of herself from a multiverse were doing the calculations. How is your injury? My soul is injured, but nothing that a few months of rest won't cure, replied Edward. That's good. So, what's next? Do you want to start building your own speed force immediately? No. The original one might intervene in our actions. Plus, it's time to leave this world to prevent any possible trouble. We're leaving immediately. No, there are still a few things of value in this world, replied Edward. His next step was cleaning up the mess Barry's actions left behind. He first wiped out the memory of everyone on the planet from any memories related to supernatural or metahumans. Secondly, he released a virus on the planet that modified the DNA or life code of all earthlings. The DNA of the people of this world was very susceptible to mutation upon contact with dark matter or other forms of energy or universal power, that was no longer the case. The third step was to do the same thing with all the Earth's team Flash had encountered or had any connections with, including Earth-38, where Kara and the Kryptonians originated. Lastly, Edward had to eliminate the Harrison Wells variant, which created the Speed Force suit for the team and removed all traces of his existence. Aren't you going too far? asked Morgana. Harrison Wells has the potential to develop omniversal travel. Although his chances are very slim compared to Rick or the Doctor, he still has the potential especially after how much this world will change once the convergence ends. I need to remove all possibility of him actually succeeding and coming back for revenge. That's fair, I guess. But what about the speed force? It should remember your actions. I doubt the speed force would go to such an extreme length for one berry out of an infinite version. However, your words reminded me we should come back here after tier 11 to check on it. Paranoid as always. So, where to next? First, we need to get a few magics. His first destination was to acquire the Helmet of Fate that belongs to the DC Universe's version of Doctor Strange Doctor Fate. The helmet allowed him to communicate and draw power from an entity known as the Lord of Order. Edward did not care much about the spells, the latter thought, he only wanted the helmet to prepare for the MCU's sorcery magic that used other dimensions and unknown deities and creatures. Through this helmet, he had a better understanding of this magic system and could learn it much more easily. His target Shazam was the same. He deepened his understanding of this kind of sorcerer type of magic. For his next destination, Edward and Morgan took some time, navigation, and divination before landing on the correct timeline and planet. While Nethery was in invisible mode, they watched an intense battle between a Green Lantern and an army. The Green Lantern won the battle but lost his life in the process. As the last light of his life passed away, the ring flew away to find its next owner. Of course, Edward would not let it escape since it was his target. He did not even let the Green Lantern's soul pass peacefully as he stole the latter's memory before he died. Fascinating, isn't it? commented Edward as he looked at the ring surrounded by a powerful shield. Yes, a type of magical weapon that weaponizes willpower, this thing is perfect for you. If you were not such a terrible person, the thing would have probably directly chosen you. Was that last part necessary? Edward rolled his eyes, but Morgana ignored him. The good news is this thing is a form of magic, so it should be easier to study and replicate. Morgan was partially correct. They quickly recreated the magic behind the rings, but it would fall apart after one use. In the end, they concluded they needed to travel to away the habitats of the Guardians, creators of the Rings and Green Lantern Corps. After knowing the Rings' potential, Edward did not want to confront the Lantern Corp it was not worth it. So, he used the memories he stole from the dead Lantern he stole the ring from. He released a weaponized Obscurious in some part of the galaxy, creating an artificial crisis. As expected, the Lantern Corp sent 90% of their members to contain the devastating power of the Obscurial. Edward took advantage of this opportunity to infiltrate their main headquarters and found the core secret of the Rings. After this escapade, it was only a matter of time before he recreated his version of the ring. Green light enveloped Edward as he felt a rushed power. 
His willpower experienced a transformation, allowing him to use it effortlessly and to greater heights. I can now destroy this universe with this ring, he commented. The ring granted him tier 10 power. Although his finding method was limited to creating weapons and energy blasts, it was still tier 10 and one achieved without the floating city. Of course, another downside is that he needed to charge it occasionally, but he was more than satisfied with a tier 10 weapon that was easily carried as he only needed to add one more ring to his fingers. It took him a while to study and create the ring, and by the time he finished, his soul injury had headed. He had to acquire two more things, say goodbye to Diana before leaving this world. Announcement, according to my previous outline, the MCU arc should have been right after this world, and midway through, he would have gone to the Fate slash Moon universe. I've rearranged things so that this arc would be immediately after the DC slash Flash universe so that the MCU arc can flow smoothly. There might still be other worlds during the MCU arc, but I will reserve such a move if the arc becomes dull and needs excitement. Disclaimer, I have only watched Fate Zero and half of Fate slash Stay Night Unlimited Blade works. This arc will take place in Fate slash Stay Night, and I will take some liberty with the plot. I do not know anything about Fate's other timelines and do not intend to get into that mess. Additionally, it will be a mini-arc instead of a very short or brief arc. But it will also be very important and play a significant role in the time game. 565 Visit Edward's next target was the DNA sample of the Kryptonians, as he had great use for it. Manufacturing high-tier clones is a very costly endeavor as he needs the mana to forcefully raise their tier while also considering how to nurture their souls. After mastering soul law, he mastered the ability to create artificial souls, making things slightly easier but still costly. Additionally, these clones have very limited lifespans, which is a problem in itself. But the Kryptonian life code is the key to solving this problem. He can now clone them in mass like any other clone before placing them in a facility with immense solar energy. He can design the place to accelerate these clones' ability to absorb solar energy to increase their growth. With this method, he can manufacture tier 5 to 6 clones in batches, creating a mighty army. These clones won't be even more powerful because he needs to modify their life code to remove the Kryptonian's natural weakness against magic. Of course, he also has to worry about possible revolts and so on. Once that was finished, he searched for his next target the anti-life equation. The anti-life equation was a transcendental mathematical formula initially said to allow those who knew it to dominate the will of any sentient race, this is the ultimate goal of Darkseid. Edward wanted to get his hands on it as he believed he might access the mind authority after studying it and the mind stone from the MCU. It's not working, Morgana declared. Whatever form of divination I try, I cannot find the location. We might have to buy the information from the Akashic record. I tried, but even news on where this thing is too expensive, replied Edward. Let's try a little cause and effect trick to see if we can find it. He cursed whoever held the anti-life equation. His purpose was to find this person through the karmic link formed between them after cursing the individual. Normally, this tactic would not have worked since curses require a medium or more information to go on, but since he controlled curse rule, he had fewer limitations. It's not working, sighed Edward. That's to be expected, we're searching a single thread from an infinite multiverse, replied Morgana. What now? We can try hunting down variants of dark side. No, we have a better way, said Edward. You mean luck? Yes. This might work, nodded Morgana as she summoned a Felix Felicis. Luck, or the control of probability, was a powerful thing. Over the years, the luck potion has been thoroughly studied, understood, and updated. Edward does not like to overuse this thing as it has long been revealed that overusing the potion will have severe consequences, primarily a curse of misfortune, where someone will have terrible bad luck. Edward wiped the corner of her mouth. So, what's on your mind? I have this urge to see Diana again. Could her timeline contain the equation? Asked the little elf. Very likely. In that case, let's go. We can get the equation and say our goodbyes. The netheral opened a breach in space-time before navigating to its destination. So, we couldn't land not long after I left, asked Edward, looking at the modern metropolis before him. You know how strange this world is. I'm not complaining, he said calmly. He scanned the entire planet, scrutinizing all seven billion people. Found it. Where? Edward showed her a projection of a man in his sixties with brown hair, smoking a cigar and a gold ring in his pinky. Billion dollar baits. From his knowledge of the comics, this man was the only person who had the equation in his mind. Can you get it from his mind? No problem. Although the formula granted him the power of mind control, he is still technically a normal human, replied Edward, swiftly taking the formula from the latter's mind. The formula was, loneliness plus alienation plus fear plus despair plus self-worth divided by mockery divided by condemnation divided by misunderstanding guilt shame failure judgment n equals y where y equals hope and n equals folly, love equals lies, life equals death, self equals dark side. Edward knew it from the comics, but it had to be pronounced in specific ways. Upon success, alien symbols or glyphs would materialize in the air. He tried it, and it was a success. What an interesting equation, commented Morgana. It will release a frequency that affects a person's deep subconscious and instill upon them the mathematical certainty that life, hope, and freedom are pointless and break their will in the process. Even someone with a high willpower like yourself can be affected if not careful. This equation will do wonders for the development of mind magic, commented Edward. 
Do you plan to make it public? Mind magic is inherently dangerous. So, even without this formula, its development is a cause for concern, replied Edward. So, we only need to continue with the strict preventive measures as we have done. His main focus was never mind magic, so it is best to let others study the formula while he reaps the benefits. True. However, you should develop a life equation to counter this one before making it public. That was my plan, nodded Edward. Let's go see Diana. He disappeared from his spot. Who's there? Asked Batman, who was the first to notice an uninvited guest had appeared in the room. Everyone became on guard before finding Edward casually looking at them. Edward, asked Diana. Sorry for the intrusion. It's really you. She flew from her seat and landed before him. She hugged him. I haven't seen you in decades. For you, it's been decades. But for me, it has been a little over a year. Are these the wonders of interdimensional travel? Regardless, it's good to see you again. Likewise. Diana, are you going to introduce us to your friend? Asked Superman. Wonder Woman, get away from this man, yelled Flash. Flash, what's with this reaction? She asked. The moment I laid eyes on him, I received a great warning from the speed force. This man is extremely dangerous. Everyone once again raised their guards, which they'd previously lowered. Diana frowned before looking at Edward. What did you do? Edward calmly smiled. Remember the research I told you about? Yes. Well, I was studying how to replicate the speed force, and it did not like that. Let's just say I used some extreme means to succeed, and we are not on good terms. Diana wanted to shake her head, she had long known he was not law-abiding. Luckily, he usually resorts to peaceful methods instead of force when dealing with things. And what kind of extreme measures? Asked Batman. Nothing that concerns you, replied Edward. Okay, Edward is my friend, and I vouch for him, said Diana before looking at him. We're in an important meeting. If you don't mind, wait until we finish. Are you guys discussing Darkseid? Darkseid? You know who is trying to invade Earth? Asked Cyborg. I saw the parademons on Earth, and that's his army, replied Edward. Who is this dark side? asked Hal Jordan a Green Lantern. Unlike Flash, he felt a connection toward this stranger and wondered about its origin. Dark side, ruler of the nightmare world, Apocalypse. He's a new god that has conquered countless worlds, and Earth is his next target. How do you know so much? Batman asked, but Edward did not pay him any mind. He looked at Diana and said, I'm interested in Apocalypse technology. I don't mind helping you out if you want. Diana did not immediately accept but looked at the team, what do you think? We could use all the information possible, uttered Superman, and soon, the others, with the exception of Flash and Batman, also agreed. So, Edward sat next to Diana as he participated in this Justice League meeting. 566 Tension Edward tapped his finger on the table and instantly hacked the Justice League's system. Cyborg who was the one who instilled it with Batman's help looked at him in shock. The technology in their system was years ahead of its time, but it was hacked so easily. I have only met variants of Darkseid from different parallel dimensions, but all of them were the same. Ruler of Apocalypse, Conqueror, uses a powerful and inescapable Omega Beam, and searching for the anti-life equation, explained Edward, who showed them his primary data on Darkseid. And what exactly is this equation? asked Diana. An equation capable of breaking any sentient life's will and controlling them, replied Edward casually. With it, he should have no issue ruling the multiverse. Mind controlling? How powerful are we talking about? asked Superman, who had experienced this issue before. And, previously, I mentioned I was using the Justice League, War Trilogy as my main source of inspiration for Wonder Woman and the eventual Justice League. Now, I have changed my mind and decided to take from many different sources, including Justice League, Unlimited and the comics. How do I explain this, uttered Edward. The bat furry over there is the person with the highest willpower amongst you, but even he could not resist it if a ten-year-old child used the formula. Hal Jordan almost laughed out loud, he had to use his famous willpower to stop himself. Batman was as stoic as ever, while Diana kicked Edward slightly to reprimand him, but he only shrugged. Superman, who felt the tension and awkwardness of the room, spoke, if it's so powerful, we must prevent Darkseid from getting his hand on it. So, what is the plan? Do we preemptively attack Apocalypse or wait until he comes to us? It says the beam is as fast as any speedster. That could be a major issue, added Cyborg. That is yet to be corroborated, countered Flash. The man has literally studied the speed force. Don't you think that's something he would know of? Cyborg argued. All I'm saying is we must watch out and prepare for all eventual possibilities. You have a point. The discussion about the next course of action continued, and everyone chimed in with their opinion, except Edward, who was looking in the distance, still thinking about that formula. Something is not right, suddenly said Diana, looking at Edward. Excuse me. From what I know about you, this equation is the kind of thing you would jump at to research, yet here you are without a single thread of interest. That's because I already have the equation and, thus, not interested. Diana almost let out a groan as she massaged her temple. Oh, Hera, couldn't you just keep that information to yourself, she thought, feeling the tense silence in the room. So, you know where it is, she swiftly asked. Yes, in the mind of a rich man called Billion Dollar Bates. You guys should probably protect him or something. However, be prepared since he knows how to use the formula, gag his mouth to prevent him from speaking. 
We'll keep that in mind, said Superman, trying to change the subject. What are you going to do with it? Asked Batman. What does it have to do with you? You're an unknown individual, possibly a criminal, possessing knowledge with worldwide ramifications. So, I think we all deserve to know what you will do with it. Edward looked at him and the others, I'm only a passenger in this dimension. Once I say my proper goodbye to Diana, I will leave, and you won't see me again. And we're supposed to trust your words, continued Batman. You want to talk about trust? Why don't you tell the people here about the contingencies plan you created for each other in case they've gone rogue dot? What? Batman, is that true? Asked Superman. Bruce, tell me this is not true, added Diana. The Justice League is a formidable force of good, but it can also be used for evil. Do you think so little of us? Asked the Flash. Not cool, man, stated Green Lantern. I do not doubt your character. But as you saw with this equation, sometimes, the choice is not yours. So eloquently spoken, sneered Edward. Why didn't you create a plan for yourself? I know what you've convinced yourself, the Justice League is my contingency plan. But you and I know you're simply too arrogant and believe you're incorruptible. You don't know me. On the contrary, I do. You and I are more alike than you know, losing parents at a young age, fiercely intelligent, paranoid, and like to be prepared for the worst. The difference between us is I don't let my trauma define me, I've learned to grow, to mature, but you're still that little boy who watched his parents die in that alley. Enough, Edward, you've gone too far. Maybe, he replied before standing up. Like I said, I'm just a passerby. Once you deal with dark side, we can say our goodbyes, and I can leave. He disappeared from the room, leaving the meeting. The room was quiet for a moment before Superman continued. We will discuss Batman's inappropriate behavior later, let's focus on this upcoming invasion. After a small discussion, the team decided to capture Billion Dollar Bates first before preparing for the upcoming battle, it helped that he was a criminal and had just cause for their actions. A few days later, Edward held a mother box in his hand, analyzing and disassembling it. He sensed a visitor and opened the door to his apartment in New York. What happened in that meeting? Diana asked. You're usually so calm and composed. As you can see, I'm not a big fan of the bat, shrugged Edward. Back in primordial Earth, he used to be a superfan of Batman. However, as he grew up, he wanted to read characters that grew emotionally, but the writers never allowed Batman to do so. He had a similar issue with Spider-Man, as the writers never allowed him to evolve as a character. Later, he developed a great disdain for Batman because of his fans, he was sick of their constant arguments about how the man could do anything with prep time. That is very obvious, sighed Diana. Don't mention him. You looked lovely, commented Edward. Although she was dressed casually in jeans, heels, and a shirt, the clothes could not hide her divine beauty. Thanks for the compliment, but I'm here on official league business. What now? They wanted me to ask if you knew when the invasion was. In three days, he replied. And how do you know? I've already reverse-engineered some of their technology. The parademons who escaped have already set up a portal to Apocalypse, and it will open in three days. If that's true, we must stop them beforehand. That should buy you a few more hours. Diana frowned, has Darkseid prepared to open the portal from his side? Based on the reconnaissance probes I've sent into Apocalypse, that's correct. In that case, we need to hurry, said Diana, preparing to leave. We will catch up later. Wait up, said Edward, stopping her. He opened a small portal to summon a small cube. What's this? Asked Diana as she received this thing. Once the battle starts, press the button, and it will drag Darkseid and his army into the mirror dimension. In there, you can fight with all your strength without affecting the planet, you can even blow it if you please. Really, said Diana with shining eyes. One disadvantage of a hero is the restraint he or she must exercise to protect the surrounding people, houses, and even the planet. People like him and Clark cannot use all their strength. Thank you for this. Consider it an apology for how I acted towards your friends. 567 Goodbye the Mother Box was a fascinating piece of technology. It was a living computer with many abilities, including opening boom tubes, spatial tier for teleportation, healing, energy manipulation, gravity manipulation, mental communication, etc. Edward had the knowledge and capabilities to replicate all its abilities, including the part about being a living computer made of organic and inorganic matter. Studying the box only added a new variety to his and the Empire's technology tree, but that was not the main reason for his interest. According to the comic, the mother box drew power from the source, which is one aspect of the presence, or God in the DC universe, in simpler terms, the source is an enormous source of power that he lusts after. After reverse engineering the mother box, he discovered that the comics were correct, this thing did draw power from a powerful dimension or entity, but he did not dare search for it. The presence is the creator of the DC universe and thus has transcended tier 11, in other words, he's an entity that is at least tier 12. Although he had previously fought God or Yahweh, that was on a different scale. Plus, he's unsure if they are the same entity despite the comics often claiming they are. It's unfortunate but not worth the risk, Edward shook his head. He decided to settle for the best thing the Omega Effect or Dark Sate's source of power. The Omega Effect allowed Darkseid to travel at will through space and time, so Edward knew it might be useful for his time game. Additionally, when he uses the Omega Beam, it can erase people from existence, similar to his power of destruction. 
If I remember correctly, Darkseid is a tier 11 god but is stuck in a higher dimension and cannot interfere in the lower dimensions without using an avatar. While he's distracted with this invasion, I might be able to sneak into this dimension and steal a little bit of the Omega effect. After analyzing the situation, he decided to use one of his trump cards to ensure success, the false multiverse fail-safe plan. The idea is to use his time rule to summon time remnants of his floating city. He would summon the city from a second, two seconds, three seconds, and so on from the past until he has more than a million of them. Then, he would link these time remnants to the main floating city, thus achieving a temporary or false tier 11. According to past trials and errors, he will only have a very short window with that boosted power, and he needs to use it to steal some of the Omega effect. As long as he prepares early on, this plan could succeed. Edward did not waste time as he set up everything for his heist. Diana and the Justice League were busy preparing, he was also doing the same thing. So, three days later, things started. Edward watched the battle in the mirror dimension, and every member brought their best. Superman did not have to hold back his strength and speed, and nor did the Flash. Batman used his best exoskeleton suit, Green Lantern showed why the ring is known as one of the most powerful weapons in the universe, Aquaman could flood any area without any care, and Cyborg showed his technomancy capabilities while working in tandem with Batman. Lastly, Diana was a force of nature. She had access to Edward's virtual reality headset for decades, allowing her to learn most of the Empire's martial arts and battle techniques. She also had his bracelet, which allowed her to wield Zeus Divine Thunder, and she learned a great deal about thunder spells from the headset. Lastly, she somehow contacted Olympus after his absence and gained possession of her famous bracelet of submission slash bracelet of victory, one of the few things in the universe capable of directly blocking Dark Sate's Omega Beam. Not bad, he commented before proceeding with his plan. He calculated the best time before sprinting to action. Arc. Disgusting mortal. Those words reverberated in his mind as he escaped Dark Sate's dimension with his prize. He wiped the blood dripping from his nose, that went better than expected. Say that to yourself, complained Morgana. See this. She showed him a screen. That screen echoed in countless timelines, possibly the entire multiverse. Did it break or affect anything? No, but now, we definitely cannot say for long. Well, that was already the plan, said Edward, who immediately began to analyze the purple orb in his hand. The result was somewhat disappointing. The Omega effect was a unique power that combined a little bit of the power of creation with mostly destruction. Its ability to travel space and time is nothing more than destroying specific parts of the space-time continuum and forcefully creating tears that lead to any place or time. Such a power perfectly matched someone like Darkseid but was probably useless to his time game. The good news is this thing did have some value. It was an excellent reference for his study of void energy, which also had both destruction and creation characteristics. Lastly, it also helped his destruction rule. Did you see my fight? Asked Diana, dressed casually as she sat in a booth at a diner. I did, and it was wonderful, replied Edward. Wonderful? That's all you have to say. What else do you expect me to say? Be a little more excited or impressed. What can I say? You guys barely destroyed the solar system. To me, or even Darkseid, this level of a fight is now child play. Your dimension must be a nightmare for regular people. It is, nodded Edward. Let's not talk about this. Tell me, what happened to you after I left? Nothing exciting happened in the first few years as I listened to your advice and waited for the right time to become an ambassador in the world of men. It was quite difficult after seeing the atrocities of World War II, but one persevered. And when it was time, I did not even have to convince my mother as the gods of Olympus contacted us and granted me these bracelets. Edward looked at them, he could tell they were made similarly to the Lasso of Truth but also contained the Guardian slash Protection Authority. They told me to become their ambassador, and I answered their call. Did you even learn what had happened to them? No, I only know something happened that affected all pantheons. Edward nodded, thinking it was probably related to the Convergence. Once I joined the world, Clark, or Superman, had just begun to appear to the world. Soon afterward, there were more and more like-minded individuals, and we formed the Justice League to help people. You seem happy, I mean, happier than when we last saw each other. Well, I found a purpose to which I can dedicate my life, and I am very content with it. Yes, having a purpose can have this effect. The two spent the next few days talking and rekindling their friendship. They traveled, talked, ate, and Diana asked for a rematch with the caveat Edward had to use the same tear as her. She lost, of course, but put on a great fight. Her talent for close combat is better than him, and her skills are now on PAR, if not better, after using the headset, but he still had thousands of years of experience above her. Three days later, it was time for Edward to leave. Can't you stay a little longer? Unfortunately, that's not possible, replied Edward. When will I see you again? Asked Diana. I will see you again, right? Maybe. Those are not reassuring words. I will be very busy. So you might see me in a few months, a few years, or never. As a dimensional traveler, time is not really a constraint for me. Your words are raising eyebrows, Diana said. If you need help, say so, and I will not hesitate to offer it. I know, but there is no need for that, Edward replied before looking her in the eyes. Bruce is a great guy, I have no doubt he can make you happy. So, you knew. My outburst was not simply because of how I personally feel about him. 
I did not take you for the jealousy type, she said with a smile. I have my low points. But what I said is true he can make you happy. I don't know. He has always had reservations about our relationship because of our line of work. Plus, I couldn't stop thinking about your words. He can change, added Edward. I've seen. After he surrounds himself with his adopted children the Robins he does change. At that point, you only need to see the right therapist, and he can overcome his trauma. Do you really think so? I wouldn't say so otherwise, nodded Edward. However, you should be wary of a woman named Talia Al Ghul. Why? She has a son with Bruce named Damien, but he was not really a willing participant in the procreation process if you know what I mean. So cruel. I'm afraid so. I will be on the lookout. Good. One last thing in case we don't see each other again. Don't say that. Listen since it's important, said Edward in a serious tone. The entire multiverse is about to be forced into a war of unparalleled proportions. If you want to protect the people you love, become as powerful as possible. Edward sighed deeply, I want to say do whatever is necessary to acquire power, but I know this goes against your personality, so I won't embarrass myself. But you should understand my intention or the severity of the situation. A war? With whom? And when? Swiftly asked Diana. I don't know much, but what I do know, with your immortality, you will live to see it happen. Be prepared. I, understand. Edward nodded, hugged, and kissed her on the cheek before hopping into his floating city and leaving for the void, his next destination was the Fate-slash-Moon universe. 34,568 The Holy Grail War As Edward stood in the void, he felt relieved that things went smoothly this time. He looked at the world before him, deep in thought. The Akashic Record warned him about directly entering this world, telling him to be careful and possibly expect rejection. Edward was about to anchor his city before sending a projection when Morgana suddenly appeared. Emergency. What happened? Are we under attack? Swiftly asked Edward, he knew how dangerous the void was. You didn't let me finish my words, Morgana replied. I was going to say an emergency message. Oh, is it from home? No, it's from the spies in the Samsara Hall. Edward's eyes immediately lit up. During his trip to the Naruto universe, he trained a few spies to infiltrate a god space, hoping to steal that person's weapon. What did they say? The first step of infiltration was a success. Edward smiled after hearing this. He needed an identity in whatever version of Earth these people originated for and lured the purple robe deist into choosing him into his space. He theorized that the bastard should be monitoring the entire planet, but his focus should be on his home China and the so-called main enemy of his country the US. So, he made his clone with this idea in mind. He was born in South Africa and displayed an extremely high IQ at a very young age, which allowed him to attend Oxford University and graduate with many degrees. However, he soon became a laughingstock of the world of academia because of his unprovable claim that supernatural powers were possible in the universe. After years of rejection, sneering, bullying, and ridicule, he became a drunk and disappeared from the world's view, becoming a paid hacker for the underground. Such an obsession should get into the purple robe deist's radar and receive an invitation. I hope things proceed smoothly from now on, muttered Edward. He provided the team with all the ways to create an identity for him, including written records, people's memories, personal relationships, published papers, and even countless videos taken from public cameras. He even gave these spies a few luck potion vials to ensure nothing goes wrong. All right, let's get back to business. Edward sent his projection to the world. The Akasha was both reasonable and unreasonable, complained Edward as he appeared in the middle of a magical circle. He looked at the young girl with twin tails before him. You must be my master. Yes, that's me, replied Tosaka, are you a caster? Unfortunately, an archer. Then, why do you have a wand? I am a mage, but my class is archer. I see. So, may I ask who you were? Is it someone I would know? Probably not, replied Edward. Give me a moment to get acclimated with this body. Although an odd request, Tosaka nodded. Through the projection, Edward convinced the Akasha a metaphysical space that contains the sum total of all events, possibilities, and knowledge in all the multiverse. However, the latter agreed with the condition that he would become a servant and participate in the Holy Grail War. His real body could not descend to this world, so he needed to create an avatar. Regardless of the limits, he was happy he could enter this game as he had two primary objectives, Gilgamesh and Enika's noble phantasm, Enuma Elish. Gilgamesh's ability takes the form of a weird-looking sword, but the main thing is its ability to revert things to a state of genesis or creation the weapon is a pure manifestation of destruction, bending the world to a level that is considered manipulating the truth. If he could get his hands on it, Edward was confident he could build a powerful tier 11 weapon to deal with the Time Guardian. Meanwhile, Anakis Inuman Elish manifested in the forms of chains called Chains of Heaven, and its main ability is to bind all things in the universe. The thing had the ability to hold the heavens, multiverse, from falling apart. What interests Edward the most about this thing is the gods were created purposely to restrain them, so it was a perfect weapon for the Time Guardian. Of course, these two things were not the only thing of interest to him. This world contained primordial runes, and Edward wanted to get his hands on them to begin his project of synthesizing void runes by analyzing and combining primordial runes from many different worlds. Your stats, said Tosaka, not hiding her shock. She was initially disappointed after seeing the C, average rating for things like attacks, defense, luck, and even agility, considering the latter's class was an archer. 
Then, she saw the axe, exceptional and beyond human limits, rate for mana. But that was not the end. She saw his skills, combat expert, A plus or excellent, extreme senses, A, magic mastery, X, rune magic, X, and noble phantasm, X. Are you a mage from the age of gods? Asked Tosaka. Something like that, replied Edward. In this world, it is irrefutable that the older and more ancient the magic, the more powerful it is. Most modern mages pursued the power of the ancient, but sadly, magic is slowly deteriorating. So, can you use true magic? Yes and no. My class is still archer, so I'm limited by many things. Is that why your magic immunity is only B-above average? Exactly, nodded Edward, finishing reorganizing his thoughts. We have a lot of work to do. While creating this heroic spirit, he successfully learned about this world's magic or magecraft. The mages in this world use mana to change the world around them, but they are limited to magic circuit, similar to magic veins back in the empire. However, magic circuit does not run through the physical body but the soul. Ancient mages were much more powerful because they did not have to use a magic circuit to interact with the world. Magical energy was abundant and easier to wield back then. Work? What work? Asked Tosaka. We don't have much time for me to train you in the old ways of magic, so I will need to modify your magic circuit, improve it, if you will. What? Are you crazy? If something happens to her circuit, she will never be able to use magic ever again, she would rather die than accept such a fact. Little girl, despite my high mana capacity, I'm still limited by your mana reserve. You must improve if you want me to use all my abilities. But, I've never heard of increasing mana circuit besides marrying the right person and hoping the descendants inherit higher circuit numbers. Of course, you haven't heard of it since it involves soul manipulation. Manipulating the soul? This kind of magic should be very close to true magic and may even be one. You're correct. And you can use this kind of magic, asked Tosaka. It will take some effort in my current form, but there should be no problem. Why are you willing to go to such extreme lengths to help me? Tosaka asked, not hiding her skepticism. Do you have a wish to ask for the grail? I'm not interested in this thing since it's a fraud. But if used correctly, I can have a real body and return to the world. What do you mean by fraud? Don't worry about that for now. No, tell me now, or I will use one of my commands, replied Tosaka, showing the stigmata on top of her right hand. Edward's lips twitched. All masters have three absolute commands to use against their servant, and his heroic spirit avatar is not immune to this rule. Calm down, girl. He did not want to experience what it's like to be controlled. Then, tell me the truth. All right. Since the fourth grail war, the holy grail has been tainted by negative emotions. Anyone who uses it will have their wish twisted into a malevolent one. 569 The Arcane Emperor Impossible, denied Tosaka. Think about what happened at the end of the war. The Fuyaki City Fire, replied Tosaka. The previous winner, Kiritsugu, realized the truth about the grail and ordered Saber to destroy it. However, his actions released negative emotions, causing the fire. Tosaka could not immediately accept this fact. She walked back and forth, thinking about this news. Who would corrupt the grail? If you think about it carefully, you should be able to figure it out. After thinking for a moment, Tosaka asked, one of the three founding families. Three families were responsible for setting up the Holy Grail War, so they were the most likely to corrupt it secretly. The Einsburns family, to be exact, added Edward. They made a pact with Angra Mainyu. Of course, they were not the only cause. Angra Mainyu? The person called as the embodiment of all the world's evil? Why would they do that? They've been obsessed with the third true magic and believe such a choice would help. These stupid bastards, cursed Tosaka. Language, young lady. Sorry. Wait, why am I apologizing? You're not my father. You should still show me some respect. Whatever. She decided not to swear in front of him again, but she won't admit it. You said they were not the only ones contributing to the corruption. Who else? Now is not the time to know such a thing. You? Do you want me to use the seal? Listen to me, Edward said calmly and authoritatively while looking at her directly. Some truths must be learned at the correct time. Don't act like a child throwing tantrums whenever you don't get what you want. The corruption of the grail involved a father figure in Tosaka's life, and once she learned the truth, she wouldn't be able to accept such a fact easily. Her mental instability is not ideal for when he modifies her magic circuit. I, understand, replied Tosaka, who walked out of the summoning room and sat down. Edward followed her and let her think for a moment. Wait, she suddenly said. How do you know all of this? Were you a part of the previous grail? No I use divination, explained Edward. Divination? That's not one of your skills. Rune magic is an umbrella term to explain that I can do many things with magic. I see. That's a great ability since we can know much about our enemies and even predict their movement. Of course. With me here, you're guaranteed to win this war. Winning the war, she muttered. She did not have any specific wish for the grail, but she wanted to win the war for one reason, to preserve the rights and honor of the Tosaka family. Yes, we must win, nodded Tosaka. By the way, you never told who you were. I doubt you will know me, but my name is Edward Bones. Edward Bones? The Arcane Emperor. You, know me. Of course. All magicians know your legend. You're almost as famous as the King of Heroes, Gilgamesh. 
Edward had a terrible sense of foreboding, but he remained calm as he asked, Oh, I wonder what the modern world knows of my life. According to records, you gathered magicians and magic from all over the world and created the Arcane Empire, a magical kingdom designated to study and develop magic. Tosaka's eyes lit up. The books say the time of the Arcane Empire was when magic reached its pinnacle during the Age of the Gods. Although the Arcane Empire only existed for a hundred years, you pushed the development of magic by thousands of years. I could not imagine how wonderful such a period would be. Knowledge was shared and not safeguarded. Every day, countless cutting-edge inventions and magical theories that pushed the boundaries were developed. Such an era is the dream of all magicians. The corner of Edward's lips twitched. Akasha had given him a myth and legend, but what scared him was that he did not even know when he had learned these things from him. You could have at least told me, complained Edward. He also realized he might have underestimated the power of Akasha. This was not a simple tier 11 entity but went beyond it. Do you know what happened to my empire? Asked Edward, trying to get more information. Shouldn't you know about this? I just want to know how the world remembers. One of my fears was that all records of my existence and the empire would be wiped out from history. Tosaka nodded as that response made sense. It was destroyed, she replied with pity in her eyes. The gods did not like how powerful mortals were becoming under your rule, so they banded together to destroy it. The records said you personally slayed dozens of gods in the final battle, and that day was also called Gilded Blood Sky because so much divine blood was spilled that the sky turned golden red for seven days. Tosaka's voice was slightly raised as she told the story due to excitement. Meanwhile, Edward was not feeling good. The idea that he lost to the gods irked him to his very soul. Furthermore, he felt Akasha could have given him a skill with the title of God Slayer. Some historians believe the destruction of the Arcane Empire is the main reason for the end of the Age of Gods. That's an exaggeration, commented Edward. No, they might be right. After that war, the gods' influence further weakened, and all the knowledge scattered from the Arcane Empire contributed to the rise of human civilization. Edward nodded, albeit slightly distracted. The fact that he had a legend or myth in this world was good and bad news. He could not easily reveal his name to others, as they might recognize his myth and use it against him, in other words, his identity became his weakness, like all servants. After the war, I also need to research this so-called legend to say whether they were just written words or actual events that occurred. So, you're the legendary arcane emperor, uttered Tosaka, looking at him up and down. Can I ask you a few questions? Sure, but don't expect answers for certain things. That's fine, she nodded. There are rumors you would summon past and future mages to contribute to the empire. Is that true? Well, I can manipulate space-time and even access parallel worlds, so it's probably true. Then, where is my invitation? She asked directly. What can I say? You simply did not meet our requirements. You. Don't ask things you know the answer will hurt you. Humph, I won't argue with a dead man. Oh, that's harsh. Second question, is the legendary floating city Netheril real? Asked Tosaka. The thing was labeled as the pinnacle of human alchemy a creation praised even by the best gods of forgery, but there are debates on its existence. So, was it real? The pinnacle of humanity, huh, muttered Edward, that was another phrase that bothered him, but he could not argue against it. His artificer accomplishments were not the pinnacle in this world as many of God's creations, like the Enuma Elish, surpassed even his floating city. It was real, he answered. Really? Can I see it? Her eyes were practically glowing. Yes, but not now. Tosaka smiled, happy she got to see such a magical wonder. Last question, are the arcane runes as wonderful as the books said? My arcane rune? They weren't passed down. Sadly, no, she replied. Rumors have it they were a magical language on PAR with the divine words and could even compare with primordial runes. More importantly, they were created to suit humans perfectly. Can you show it to me? Better yet, once this war is over, I'll teach it to you? Really? Asked Tosaka, not hiding her excitement. She quickly calmed down, can I even learn? Modern magicians cannot learn much ancient magic because of the decline of the supernatural in the world or because of extreme requirements, such as having some divinity. The only requirements are to be a mage and have a soul, so there is no need to worry about learning. Great. She could not help but be excited at the prospect of learning such powerful magic. With it, she can improve the Tosaka's jewel magecraft and elevate it to a higher level. Now that you know who I am, can you trust me to modify your magic circuit? Hmm, since you're the arcane emperor, it's understandable you could do something like that. Tosaka gritted her teeth, fine, I'll trust you, what should I do? 570 new circuit you don't need to do anything specifically, Edward responded. But I must tell you, the process will be excruciatingly painful. Your wording makes the situation even more concerning, said Tosaka. I'm just warning you so you can be prepared. I can bear a little bit of pain. Little bit of pain. Edward shook his head. If we had more time, I could have concocted a pain-relieving potion for you. Better yet, if only I could easily access my inventory, I could get it there. Alas. Pain-relieving? Couldn't we get something from the hospital or pharmacy? Asked Tosaka. No. The pain is from your soul, so those won't work. Edward walked back into the summoning room. He erased the summoning circle before slowly drawing one of his own. Quick question, do you still have the pendant to summon Saber? Hmm? Why are you asking such a question? Just answer. If you must know, I don't. 
I gave it to someone who once saved my life. Edward's mouth twitched. Oh, who is it? You don't need to know. It's Shiro Emiya, isn't it? How do you know? Are you using divination on me? Stop it. Otherwise, I will use one of my command seals. Edward ignored her. In the Fade Slash Stay Night series, Tosaka did not give the pendant to Shiro until after she summoned her servant and saved him from an attack from Lancer. With the pendant, Shiro the protagonist could accidentally summon Saber, one of the most potent servants in the series. Now, in this strange timeline, he was, Shiro received the pendant earlier, most likely to ensure he becomes the seventh servant and also summons Saber. The Akasha contains the sum total of all events and possibilities. So, it created a timeline where small things like this are different. Well, that's completely correct since I also have to consider the Arcane Empire. Edward finished drawing the rune on the floor while his mind was also thinking about other things. Done. What should I do? Just step in the middle and embrace yourself. Tosaka took a deep breath while muttering under her breath, it's just a little pain. She walked to the middle and said in a meek voice, I'm ready. The magic circle immediately lit up, and Tosaka's screen of agony followed soon. When she usually used magic, a visual representation of her magic circuits manifested in her body. However, they were not green as usual but dark red. Her body twisted on the ground, and her voice soon became hoarse. Little girl, that's the price of rapid power, thought Edward before looking at the window. The process only lasted 30 minutes, which, in hindsight, is not long. However, for someone suffering unimaginable pain, every second felt like an eternity. Edward knew the process ended when the soft moaning and groan stopped. He conjured a large cup of water for her, and Tosaka drowned herself in it. Slow down and pace yourself. You? I thought I was going to die, she complained. I told you it would be painful. It's you who claims it was only a little pain. Tosaka was too tired to argue with him. She could only drink water to feel anything in her body. After more than a minute of rehydration, she finally felt better. Better. Tosaka nodded. In that case, why don't you check your magic circuits? Her eyes lit up as she activated her magic. The look of shock on her face was palpable. 108 magic circuits. She genuinely did not know what to say. Most mages are born with less than 20 circuits. Anyone above that number can be considered talented. Initially, she had 40 circuits and was considered an elite in the magical world regarding talents. But now, she could not describe her newfound power and talent. It's not a simple 108, added Edward. I added an additional magic veins that ran through your nervous system, it should grant you an additional 12 circuits. It's a shame this is the limit of your genes, and there is no time or essentials to improve you on a genetic level. Are you saying that my physical body itself can hold mana? Asked Tosaka. That's right. She did not know what to say. Was ancient civilization so much more developed than modern times? Why did this ancient magician seem to know more about science than the current era? There is no need to underestimate yourself. The weakening of modern mages results from changes in the environment, not the lack of ability, persuaded Edward, as he did not want the little girl to lose confidence in herself. Now, ready to try your new power. Of course. Edward raised his staff to create a barrier that surrounded the room. Don't hesitate. Tosaka did not hesitate. She used all the attack magic she knew, including her family's jewel magic. I can't believe magic can be so powerful, she yelled. I believe now I can easily defeat some of the middle-tier servants. And with the right circumstances, I can face any of them. You would be way more powerful if your mana control were not so atrocious, said Edward. It was so bad that it physically hurt. Ho ho, what a big tone, she sneered. Why don't you show me how bad it is? Already allowing the power to get to your head. I just want to know what the most famous magician in the world is capable of. The battle lasted five minutes, and by the end, Tosaka was lying on the ground, breathing heavily. She had never fought a more grievous battle. Her opponent would attack the subtle incongruity in the flow of mana, showing her lack of control. She could not cast a single spell in the past five minutes because of the constant interruption. You should learn to listen to your elders, smirked Edward. I'm not talking to you, yelled Tosaka. All right, enough playing around. You can learn how to control mana later on. Our primary goal is to discuss our next course of action for the war. Tosaka sat up with a serious expression, do you have any idea? Our first target should be Lancer or Caster. Personally, I want to deal with Lancer first, but Caster is our greatest enemy. Why them? asked Tosaka. Lancer contained the knowledge of 18 primordial runes in his mind, and I'm very interested in getting them, replied Edward with shining eyes, but Tosaka almost rolled her eyes. You never studied the primordial runes. Only a few minor ones, he replied, lying without showing any trace. If I had that piece of knowledge, how could I lose to these damn gods? Apparently, the thing contained some of the essence of magic. Plus, if we could find his master through him, we might find the rest of the runes. I guess I understand why you would be interested, nodded Tosaka. By the way, what is Lancelot's identity? See you Kilane. The Irish hero and demigod. The one and only. So, his teacher is Scathatch. That's right, nodded Edward. I've always wanted to meet her. Why? Interested, asked Tosaka with a weird smile. Rumor has it she is one of the most beautiful women ever. Albeit tempted by her beauty, but it's not the main reason, he explained. I just think we are alike in many ways, both rulers, powerful enough to kill monsters and gods, and having a passion for teaching the youth. It seems you have a lot in common. 
But wait, how would you meet her? Is she one of the servants in this war? No, she never died. Are you serious? Yes, she became immortal and has lived for over 2,000 years. Immortality is possible. It's not as impressive as you think. Keep the body from decaying and nourish the soul appropriately, and you can live long enough to be considered immortal. I'm beginning to feel it will be frustrating to talk to you, complained Tosaka, and Edward shrugged. What about Castor? Why is she such a threat? 571 primordial runes or not, her magic is the nemesis of all pure mages like myself, replied Edward. And she's attacking the students in your school. What? What do you mean by that? Asked Tosaka as she stood up from her sitting position. She plans to feed off the life energy of the students in the school to strengthen herself. One of your teachers Suichiro Kizuki is helping her. Mr. Suichiro? No, we have to stop them, she said as she remembered something and rushed out of the room. Edward's lips twitched as he glanced at her, departing back strangely. On top of a roof, Tosaka stopped as she sensed a powerful mana fluctuation. Such a clash was definitely the result of two servants battling it out. Wait, that direction that's near Shiro's house. Her magic circuit appeared in her legs, and she rushed forward. Little girl, you need to raise your standard of man, suddenly said Edward, causing Tosaka to fall midway through her jump. What, what, what are you saying? I'm saying you could do way better than someone like Shiro Emiya, replied Edward. Especially now that you will probably be one of the greatest modern mages that has ever lived. Don't talk nonsense, yelled Tosaka before continuing rushing forward, and Edward followed. A few seconds later, the Tsundera girl asked, What do you have against Shiro? I have immense disdain for him, replied Edward casually. Why, you don't even know him. I saw enough of his future and past to form an opinion. And what did he do that was so egregious, asked Tosaka. He didn't do anything it's his personality, explained Edward. The child failed to save one person and developed an extreme version of being a hero. There is nothing with wanting to be a hero. A little defensive, aren't we? Tosaka's face almost burned with embarrassment, but she decided to ignore that comment. Heroism is fine at its core, but not his version. His desire to save everyone comes at all costs to his life, whether it is his safety, sanity, bodily arm, or even the people he loves or cares for. It's to the point you wonder whether this man is into masochism because of the length he is willing to save people. And the worst part is he refuses to change even if he knows the consequences of this path he is walking toward. Tosaka thought briefly before replying, you're over-exaggerating thing. Am I? I'm sure you've already noticed it in school. People will ask him for a favor but just use this as an excuse to get him to do their work for them for free. And even if Shiro knows, even if he heard them admit it, he would help them no matter the task or how long it must take because that's what a hero should do. Edward sneered in disdain, he's the kind of hero who, if confronted with an absolute choice between the world and the love of his life, will try to save both just to lose everything in the process. But even such a thing won't deter him in his heroic journey. I guess I should praise his conviction. Tosaka did not know what to say. She had seen how some people treated Shiro in school, if not for her, things might have been worse. However, she had always loved his kindness and had never seen it from this perspective. While trying to think of a response, they soon reached their destination. Is that Saber and Lancer? asked Tosaka. Where are their masters? Look at the back of your boyfriend's hand. He's not my, wait, Shiro is a master. Tosaka, yelled Shiro, finally noticing their arrival. Saber stopped her battle and jumped before Shiro. Master, this is servant, and their master is very powerful, be careful. She had never met a modern mage with so much mana, and the servant also exuded a mana capacity above her. Tosaka, do you know what's going on? Asked Shiro as he began to walk toward her. Master, they are the enemy, Saber stopped him. She's not an enemy, she's my friend. He looks confused. Doesn't he know what's going on? Asked Tosaka. That's obvious. This novice doesn't even know he has to use a trigger to activate his magic circuit. He's been using his magic by forcing mana through his actual veins, the fact he's alive is truly a testament to how lucky he is. Who is this? Asked Shiro with a frown, but Edward had already shifted his focus to Lancer. I've been looking forward to fighting you. Do you know me? Asked Lancer. In a matter of speaking, replied Edward before immediately attacking. Hundreds of small blue orbs materialized before his staff and flew toward Lancer with breakneck speed. Lancer responded by waving his red spear in a circular motion to block the orbs before stopping and manually evading because of how fast and frequently they were coming. Clink, clink, clink. Lancer blocked every orb while simultaneously evading. Unfortunately, the orbs were too fast and seemed endless. So, without any more hesitation, he activated his A-rank skill, protection from arrows. With this skill, he was immune to most projectile weapons. So, he rushed toward Edward with his spear, blazing a path forward. Interesting skill, muttered Edward before tapping his staff on the ground and changing tactics. Boom, a powerful explosion forced Lancer backward. Although his battle instinct allowed him to block with the spear, he was still injured. He looked around and saw nothing, but his danger senses were on overdrive. With caution, he moved forward, and as expected, another explosion. What a quick and brilliant tactic, he praised. His enemy knew projectiles were useless to him, so they placed immobile but invisible versions all around him, forming a net. 
Answers, said Lancer, using a primordial rune, and with a wave of his spear, a mighty flame busted out and activated the invisible bombs Edward placed around. Lancer then took this opportunity to rush forward, but he underestimated the speed at which these things regenerated. Damn it, he cursed as he was further pushed back. Ewas. With this primordial rune, he boosted his defense and magic resistance. Birkanen. This tracking rune allowed him to see the invincible bombs. Now, let's see how you can hide, commented Lancer as he moved toward his destination. Not bad, but you're underestimating me, commented Edward. Under this command, the thousands of orbs began to bounce off each other, making their movement so irregular that the tracking spell became almost useless. So Lancer found himself in a minefield with invisible exploding orbs that moved fast and were as erratic as a drunkard. Oddly, though, he had a smile on the corner of his mouth as he navigated this spell, which used a basic mana missile spell. Haha, I haven't had this much fun in a fight in a while, he said. In that case, let me show you what I'm truly capable of. As he prepared to use another tactic, he suddenly stopped, which caused him a terrible explosion that almost got him. Luckily, he activated a shield and protected him. It's a shame our battle must come to an end, but I cannot disobey my master, he said toward Edward before disappearing. Edward did not stop him as he had already got what he wanted, the 18 primordial runes inside the latter's mind. He only failed to find his master's whereabouts, but he doubted Lancer actually knew. However, despite his success, he was not happy. Firstly, the primordial runes in this world are the same as the ancient runes in Harry Potter, but he already knew this. He thought the runes manifested in another form in this universe. If I remember correctly, Odin created primordial runes in some lore versions of this universe instead of discovering them. Maybe the true primordial runes are even ancient and more powerful than his version. Edward decided to check this out as what he learned paled compared to the primordial runes in his universe. And considering the level of this universe is not in any way lower than his, they should not be like this.572. Terrible first impression Edward returned to Tosaka, standing close to Shiro and Saber. What a brilliant battle, commented Tosaka. She saw everything and saw how this battle was a pure demonstration of basic skills. Edward only used a basic mana energy attack and invisible spell but displayed superb control over them. That's why I say you need better mana control. Okay, Grandpa, Tosaka rolled her eyes. Rin, can you tell what's going on, asked Shiro, and Tosaka was about to answer. But she noticed her servant and Saber eyeing each other. Do you two know each other? No, but he looked familiar, replied Saber. We do know each other, in a manner of speaking, nodded Edward. But as soon as he finished his words, everything around him stopped moving. Then, Saber's facial expression and temperament changed, she became nobler, more righteous, and her gaze more piercing. Edward immediately realized what had happened since this was not the first time, hello, senior brother. So, you're the new disciple that the master has been talking about, said Arthur Pendragon, looking up and down at Edward. His face turned into disgust, you reek of immeasurable sins. Interesting, muttered Edward as the smile on his face faded, the old man warned me of you. I guess he was underestimating how much of a jackass you were. I don't understand why he would choose someone like you, continued Arthur. People like you are the easiest to be tempted and fall into the darkness. He could have chosen anyone, so why this kind of personality? Edward put his pinky in his nose and acted like he was picking for something, are you done? He flicked the non-existent booger in her slash his direction. If you came to say this nonsense, you can leave now. Your presence already ruined my day. Arthur shook his head in disappointment. I don't know why I expected so much from you. Do you know me? Asked Edward. Not personally, but I've met your type, replied Arthur. People whose sanity is on the narrow line are usually held together by a few individuals they love. People like you are extreme as they can do whatever is necessary to achieve their goal, and yours happens to be the pursuit of magic. Did I miss something? You did not, admitted Edward calmly. But two can play at this game. Let me think about what kind of person you are. Extreme righteous who believed the world was simple, either white or black. The existence of anything that does not fall into these two categories disgusts you, and you naturally label them as black. Normally, such a normal point of view or ideals would be fine, especially with someone like Merlin protecting or shielding you from the world until the war begins. Edward saw the slight flinch of Arthur slash Saber's body. In this terrible war, your views crumbled faster than you could respond. You were forced to make decisions with terrible consequences. Now, you spent countless nights awake thinking about the righteousness you held dear. You keep asking yourself whether you are still a good man. You don't know me, said Arthur through gritted teeth. But I do, replied Edward. War is cruel, and no good man who has experienced it can truthfully say they remain good. And such a thought is simply destroying you. Have you said enough? Actually, no, continued Edward. You've obviously been building a lot of stress, and somehow, you thought you could take it out on me. I don't care about your psychological problem. Go be a little bitch somewhere else. Edward did not care whether his senior disciple did not like him, but he could be civil, at the very least, for the sake of Merlin. But no, he had to be rude on their first encounter. You, grunted Arthur as he took a step forward. Enough. A powerful voice echoed in this frozen universe, and Edward immediately recognized it. Old man, how are you, yelled Edward. I'm fine, replied Merlin. Just a little busy. It's good to hear from you, continued Edward. Same, but you need to hurry up. 
Once you reach tier 12, you will start getting involved with this war. In that case, shouldn't I slow down my progress? Asked Edward. What do you think? I know, I know, I will hurry up. I'm glad you understand. Arthur, haven't you embarrassed yourself enough? Leave now. I'm sorry, master. He quickly disappeared to prevent his master from forcing him to apologize to this bastard. I'm sorry about him, the voice echoed. It's okay. We don't have to be friends, just civil, replied Edward. Merlin sighed, I truly regretted raising him so sheltered. The war was stressing him out, let alone someone like Arthur. Kid, I'm serious. Time is running out. Time continued forward, and Edward heard Saber's feminine voice asking, So, you do know me? How? I knew your master, responded Edward. Merlin. Yes. Her frown deepened as she could not recognize this person by this description alone. Let's go to your house, and I will explain everything, said Tosaka. Back at Shiro's eyes, Tosaka explained everything about the Holy Grail War to Shiro, including the relationships between masters and servants and the fact they were enemies. Things proceeded as Edward saw them in the Fate Slash Unlimited Blade works, as Shiro could not completely wrap her head around the situation. So, Tosaka decided to bring him to see the war supervisor, Kotomine Kaire. Before we leave, could you help him? Asked Tosaka. Pardon me. He doesn't know the basics of basic. Could you give him some help so that he can at least help Saber dematerialize? Servants can return to their spirit form or materialize, but it's all based on the master's ability and mana. Unfortunately, since Shiro is a shoddy mage, Saber could only remain in physical form while losing a lot of mana. You do know they're the enemy, right? Asked Edward. I know, but he saved my life, and I don't want to be indebted to him. So, I will help him this time, then, we will be enemies. Edward looked her in the eyes. A similar thing happened in the anime, and Tosaka did not hesitate to attack Shiro, but Edward was skeptical. A mage like Shiro should not have survived for so long in even the Tosaka in the anime. Of course, the latter is the protagonist, so, understandably, the plot saved him as events soon unfolded where they had to work together. Fine, I will do it, but no I'm doing so unwillingly. That's fine. So, what's the plan? I will directly implant basic knowledge in his mind, replied Edward. We should probably do so after the church. Why? Because he will have a terrible headache for the next 12 hours after the process. Tosaka looked at him, she felt this side effect was suspicious, at the very least, the long duration was probably international. However, she could not see anything from Edward's facial expression. Very well, the team then headed to the church to meet Kisei. Void. Edward sensed the communication with his avatar, stopped what he was doing, and looked at a projection of this universe on the screen before him. He shook his head before continuing his research. He wanted to create the speed force to update Morgana's core processor as quickly as possible. Her help was indispensable if he wanted to create a tier 11 weapon.573. Berserker Edward entered a spiritual form as he accompanied Tosaka, Shiro, and Saber to the church to meet Kaire. The discussion proceeded with how he remembered it in the anime. Saber stayed outside while Shiro learned about the Holy Grail War and stated his displeasure at this game, specifically that masters must kill one another to be the final winner. He did not want to participate in such a cruel competition, but Kaire played on his desire to save people to convince him that he was the best choice to be the final winner and prevent the Grail from falling into the wrong hands. Once the conversation ended, the group returned home. The church. Why don't you say anything? Asked Kaire, talking to himself in the empty church. What do you expect me to say? Asked a shadow that seemed to have always been here, but no one noticed. The legendary arcane emperor is participating in this war, and you want me to believe you have nothing to say. It has yet been determined whether he is worthy of his legend, said Gilgamesh, who did not like how this arcane emperor is often compared to him, the king of heroes. Kaire turned to face him, is it me, or does it seem like you have a deeper reason for not liking the arcane emperor? I have nothing to hide, replied Gilgamesh. It's because of Nethery. The legendary floating city. My gate of Babylon contained all powerful mystic codes ever created or wielded by any hero, but I don't have this city or any of the arcane emperor's works besides a few of his early works, explained Gilgamesh. I don't know how he did it, but I want what is rightfully mine. The arcane emperor is famous for many things, one of which is his accomplishment in alchemy, specifically the field of mystic codes, magic artifacts. You should be careful when dealing with him, warned Kyrie. From what Lancer said, he might have detected something. Lancer's report showed that the arcane emperor only used basic spells, a sign that he was weary of prying eyes, so he decided not to reveal his real ability. Do you think I will lose? Asked Gilgamesh with a hideous expression. I'm telling you to be careful when dealing with an opponent of this caliber. After saying these words, he walked to his office without any more words. As Tosaka's group walked home, they were forced to stop as a little girl with all white hair appeared before them with a towering figure. Hello, big brother, said Ilias Viel von Einsburn. Excellent, you're here with everybody. I can kill all of you and eliminate the weaklings. Berserker, get rid of them. The close to three meters tall berserker followed his master's orders as it slowly walked toward the group. Edward suddenly appeared and said, Saber, I will assist, but you must stop it. Saber did not immediately respond to him but looked at Shiro, Master, what's your order? Do you have a plan? Let's, follow his plan. As you wish. What about me? What should I do? Asked Tosaka. You're in charge of dealing with the master. 
Go easy, and don't kill her if you can. Why? She's a girl with a poor fate. If I can help it, I don't want anything to happen to her. Tosaka gave him an odd look, if you say so. Edward raised his staff, and countless magic circles surrounded Saber, who immediately raised her guard. Relax, I'm just boosting your stats so you have a chance against such a titan. He was not lying as Saber felt a rushed power coursing through her veins. Her defense, strength, agility, stamina, magic defense, and even mana capacity had drastically increased. She glanced at him before rushing toward Berserker, directly clashing against him. Your turn, said Edward, looking at Shiro. Me? What can I do? You need to learn the basics to provide better help slash mana to Saber, Edward replied before casting a spell. As I said before, it will hurt. Shiro immediately began to groan in pain as he held his head. Edward secretly praised him for not screaming in agony on the floor. He directed his focus to the battle. Despite his buffs, Saber was still disadvantaged in his fight against Berserker, whose real identity was the Greek demigod Hercules. He raised his staff to fire mana missiles, targeting Berserker's weak points and forcing him to stop many of his offenses. Saber would take this opportunity to strike, but the demigod was extremely agile for his size. Furthermore, despite losing his mind due to his Berserker class, he still retains the battle experience and instinct from when he was sound of mind. Suddenly, an energy-based weapon materialized in Berserker's empty hand as he began to dual wield. Saber's pressure immediately intensified. Ilya's familiar, thought Edward as he recognized this type of magic that turned familiars into weapons. He checked on Tosaka's battle. In the anime, she was slightly overwhelmed by Ilya's magic, but now, it was the reverse. However, the little white-haired girl was smart and noticed Tosaka's lack of control of her mana due to the sudden increase and used it to her advantage to hold on in this fight. I cannot continue to fight so passively, thought Edward. He could sense Gilgamesh's hidden presence and knew that if he did not reveal some information, it might force the latter to act in unpredictable ways. After pondering briefly, he knew what to do. Saber continued to attack Berserker, but she was losing. The latter's stats were higher than hers, and his combat ability was much better. Her only advantage was Edward's support and intelligence, as Berserker only acted on instinct. Saber lured her opponent into a false move, and after sacrificing a sword attack on her shoulder, she created an opening. She immediately activated a part of her noble phantasm Excalibur. She generated a massive slash that cut Berserker's upper body in half. Get out of the way, screamed Edward, and Saber turned around to see what looked like a cannon appearing from a void crack above his head. She rushed forward to pick up her master, who was still in pain and rushed out of the way. The cannon flashed with thunder before firing. A booming sound echoed in the neighborhood, followed by an explosion where Berserker stood. Many of the surrounding houses were destroyed as a result of this attack. Is it over? asked Tosaka, who was blown away by the wind generated by this attack. No, replied Edward, and as expected, Berserker and Ilya appeared perfectly intact at the explosion's epicenter. It seems I was wrong, said Ilya in a cute but intimidating voice. You guys are not as weak as I believed, especially you, Saber. I look forward to fighting with you again. She disappeared without a trace, making some members of the team feel relieved. You seem to be hiding a lot from me, said Tosaka to Edward. That's obvious, he replied. You can ask once we're alone, but know some things should be known at the right time. She glanced at him but said nothing more. Shiro was still in terrible shape, so they brought him home and helped him recuperate. Why are you staring at me, asked Edward, perplexed by what Saber had been doing since they returned. Point five seventy four. Saber's wish extensive research using wiki and chat GPD. However, I'm getting confused with all the timelines and different outcomes, some with the same name. So, the plot will be different and a combination of many timelines. Thank you for your understanding. I know you, said Saber. Did she regain her memories? It makes sense since Shiro is not a true mage, thought Edward. I doubt that. The runes that appeared during your attack against Berserker. I recognized them since my master used to talk incessantly about that, continued Saber. You're the arcane emperor. Edward's lips twitched, I'm guessing your master was one of the mages I summoned. You know me, asked Saber. Yes, the legendary King Arthur, ruler of Camelot, the disciple of Merlin. Wait, you're King Arthur, asked Tosaka. But, but, I'm a woman, asked Saber, also known as Artoria Pendragon. I changed my name and gender because I believe the people would much more readily accept a man as their ruler than a woman. I guess that's understandable, nodded Tosaka. Saber looked at Edward, my master used to talk a lot about you, your ideals, creativity, love for your people, and especially about your arcane rune. I'm sure it was also very pleasant speaking to him. You don't remember, asked Saber. Unfortunately, no. Well, given who you were, it's understandable why the Grail would not let you appear with intact memory, commented Saber. If there were a servant who could remove the Grail's influence without winning the war, it would be the Arcane Emperor. Why didn't you tell me you lost your memory, asked Tosaka, who realized why he was asking so many questions after being summoned. You needed to trust me quickly, so it would complicate things if you knew I don't remember a substantial part of my life. You lied to me. And for that, I sincerely apologize, replied Edward, and Tosaka rolled her eyes, she decided to give him the cold shoulder from now on. Edward ignored the little girl's temper tantrum and focused on Saber. What exactly do you want to say? I'm curious if you have the same wish as me, she asked. I'm afraid not. Why not? 
Don't you want to see the revival of your empire? Have a chance at a redo and correct your previous mistakes, maybe even make those gods pay for what they did to you, Saber asked. I haven't decided on that yet, replied Edward, and he was not lying. After hearing about his legend, he also wanted to create another branch of the arcane empire in this world, his intuition told him doing so might have other advantages, and he even considered returning to all the worlds he previously traveled to and leaving the same empire. However, he was still skeptical about Akasha and how dangerous this world was. You may not be the man I thought you were, said Saber, looking at him. I know what you're thinking that we are similar, added Edward. However, I know more than you do. For example, I know the Holy Grail cannot grant your wish, and your attempt is futile. Is this an attempt at persuading me to give up the war? Don't waste your effort. Let me ask you something, do you remember what happened near the end of the previous war? Saber frowned, I do. You've spent a lot of time with Kiritsugu Emiya. Do you think he was the kind of man who would abandon his goal? No, he was an iron-willed mage with no bottom line or morality, willing to do anything to achieve his goals and ambitions, replied Saber. So, why did a man like this make such a bold decision? Why did he abandon the grail and force you to destroy it? Asked Edward. Because, the grail could not give him what he wanted. Saber's face pale as she reached this conclusion. Assuming the grail is omnipotent, why couldn't it grant Kuritsugu his wish? The answer is simple, either the grail's power is limited, or something is wrong with it. No, it's impossible, said Saber, who stood up. You're lying, trying to play mind games. Edward shrugged, I don't care if you believe. If something is wrong with the grail, why are you still going after it? Because I know what's wrong with it and how to utilize it. But you're not me, are you? In that case, I just need to force you to help me, said Saber, summoning Excalibur. Saber, what are you doing? Please, stop that. Everyone looked at the pale-looking Shiro, who had awakened. Master. Saber rushed to his side to help sit down. How are you feeling? Much better, replied Shiro. After calming down, he looked at Edward, is what you said true? Edward looked at him in the eyes but turned his head away and ignored him. Don't be rude, said Tosaka. I told you I would not hide my disdain for him. What did I do to you? Asked Shiro, but Edward pretended he was there. He summoned a book and began reading. Don't mind him, said Tosaka, who changed the subject. But he's telling the truth. The grail has been corrupted since the previous war. Giving the enemy important intel, are we? Commented Edward. Keep quiet and read your book, yelped Tosaka. I'm still mad at you for lying. I can't believe so much was involved in the previous war, especially since my adopted father was also involved, sighed Shiro. Saber, why didn't you tell me you know and serve him? I only remember now, she replied softly. When are we leaving? Asked Edward, cutting this conversation short. He's awakened, and you've paid your debt. Can we get back to treating them as enemies? Tosaka paused, you have a point. She stood up and looked at Shiro, you're fine now, and since you've chosen to participate in this war, we are officially enemies. When I see you again, I won't hold back, and I expect you to do the same. Tosaka walked toward the door, but Shiro yelled, wait, Tosaka. There is no need to do this, you're my friend, and I don't want to be your enemy. Then you will die a fool. That's my girl, praised Edward. Focus on winning this war and revitalizing the Tosaka name. In the future, you can have any men you want and don't have to settle for that bastard. You can be annoying when you want to do you know this. Later in your life, when you've become the most powerful modern mage of this century, you will thank me for my wisdom, replied Edward, and Tosaka decided to ignore him. Edward took this opportunity to remember his conversation with Saber, focusing on Merlin of this universe. The idea that they had a peer relationship instead of master and disciple filled him with glee. They walked home, and it was quiet. Once they reached home, Tosaka claimed she was tired and wanted to sleep. Edward wanted to discuss their next strategy but did not insist, as it had been a tiring day for a 14 or 15 year old teenager. So, he took his time to review some of the benefits he already received for coming into this world. 575 Reality Marble Reality Marble, a magical domain that some people in this world primarily some servants can create by replacing reality with a mental construct of their inner self. And in this domain, they can change the laws of physics and the rules of the world. Each mage's reality marble reflects their inner self, desires, goals, ambitions, or who they were. In other words, this reality marble is the same as the second type domain I created, which projects the soul dimension into reality, said Edward excitedly. The noble phantasm that Akasha allowed him to create was a reality marble, so he was studying it to see if he could help his arcane path, and it did. One of the major flaws of this type of domain was that the soul dimension projection had no power on its own and needed the arcanist to build a pocket dimension and fuse with it. Sadly, not many arcanists can instantly create pocket dimensions. The solution Edward came up with for this solution was the creation of void marbles, yes, he copied the name from reality marbles even before coming to this world, an artifact capable of creating the pocket dimension for the arcanists. With this thing, most arcanists can have their domain after learning how to project their soul dimension. However, he was not happy with this solution, and it was not simply because of the costly price of void marbles. He wanted magical domains to be a natural ability of arcanists, something they could achieve after years of training and learning. He did not want only space arcanists to have this ability or rely on foreign artifacts for this ability. 
Now, he finally found a way, reality marbles. The core of reality marbles is projection magic elevated to a high enough level to rewrite reality, creating a world within a world. Furthermore, the true core of this technique is powerful enough magical energy or mana to change the projection from unreal to unreal. One thing arcanists do not lack is mana, thought Edward with a smile. With this method, the bottleneck on domain technology has been broken, and once he returns, this technique or ability will become commonplace. The reality marbles are truly like a miniature world, meaning they are more than enough to compete with the real divine kingdoms of the gods, thought Edward, smiling to display his satisfaction. Just this technique is enough for this trip, muttered Edward with a smile, but he soon sighed as he missed Morgana. Times like this make him miss the little elf's voice in his mind. The next day, Tosaka had school. While walking in the hallway to work, Edward began to complain, it's been more than 1,500 years since I attended school. I can't believe you're forcing me to go. 1,500 years? The arcane empire lasted only a hundred years. Time is relatives, little girl, replied Edward. The empire might have only lasted that long, but most people were older than that. Otherwise, do you think we could achieve all this in only a hundred years? That makes sense, nodded Tosaka. It must have been a wonderful time if you guys could play with time as you see fit. Of course, said Edward with pride, even though he had absolutely no knowledge of this world's version of the arcane empire. So, are we skipping school? No, and you must stay by my side in case I'm suddenly attacked by another master. Fair point, but you should be productive here. Do you want me to spy on Mr. Suichiro? Asked Tosaka. Edward said the latter was a master doing shady things with the caster servant. No, you need to beat up Shinji Mato for maltreating his sister, explained Edward. Tosaka frowned, although I despise that guy, I cannot intervene in their family affairs especially since she would deny his action. It seems you truly do not know. What are you talking about? His sister Sakura Madu is adopted. Her previous surname was Tosaka. In other words, your sister. Tosaka froze as her body trembled, you're not lying to me. She raised her voice, garnering the intention of the people around since it appeared she was talking to herself. I would not lie about such a thing, continued Edward. This girl has suffered terribly at Shinji and the Mata family's hands. Tosaka seemed to think of something horrible, and her eyes turned red. Without hesitation, she rushed toward Shinji's class. Do you want to calm down and not do anything rash, asked Edward. Can't you erase people's memories of what I do? Yes, I can, replied Edward, chuckling. Shinji. Tosaka, asked a blue-haired young man. Why are you screaming so early in the morning? Unfortunately for him, Tosaka did not answer. She activated her magic circuit and rushed toward him. With the first punch, she broke his jaw and most of his teeth. Then, she proceeded to pummel him with tremendous prejudice. After the third punch, Shinji's face was disfigured beyond recognition, and after the fifth one, he should have died due to the sheer force of Tosaka's punches. Sadly for him, Edward was secretly providing him with healing spells, preventing his death and prolonging his suffering. Screams echoed in the classroom as the students were scared and did not know what to do, even the teacher was baffled and frozen out of shock and fear. Tosaka, stop, yelled Shiro, who finally reacted. He rushed forward, but Edward materialized before him. Don't interfere with things that don't concern you. She's going to kill him. Because he deserves it, said Edward plainly. Nothing is worth such brutality, rebutted Shiro, who took a step forward toward Tosaka. However, with one look, he felt his body bearing a tremendous weight, immobilizing him. S.A. Saber. Saber materialized in the classroom with her sword in hand. If she makes one move, I will use a large area spell to kill everyone present, threatening Edward, his voice was so calm and composed that it sent chills down Shiro's spine. You. The look in his eyes told Shiro that this man was capable of such a brutal act. So, he stood up, frozen as the beating continued for close to a minute. Then, a voice finally spoke. Rin, stop. Tosaka finally stopped as she recognized that voice. With her face bathing in blood, she looked at Sakura, her eyes finally displaying a hint of humanity, love, and regret. Why didn't you tell me about him? Why didn't you tell me you were my sister? Sakura trembled before she lowered her head, I thought, you had abandoned me. How could I do such a thing? I simply never knew, replied Tosaka, her voice laced with deep sorrow. She stood up, still holding the half-dead Shinji in one hand. You can clean up this place, right? No problem, said Edward, who used a repairing spell to repair the damage she caused before using the Obliviate charm to delete everyone's memories. They walked out of the school while Sakura and Shiro followed. Why is he with us? Sakura and Shinji are my friends, I need to know what will happen to them. Shiro Senpai can come with us, said Sakura timidly. By the arcane truth, the Tosaka family must have been cursed with terrible taste in men, complained Edward, and Sakura blushed after hearing this. Rin turned her head to give them an odd look before continuing home. Once they arrived, she threw Shinji on the corner like he was a piece of thrash and glanced at Sakura. Tell me everything the Mata clan did to you. Sakura did not immediately answer but looked at her brother, is he going to be okay? Don't worry about this piece of human garbage, sneered Tosaka. What I care about is you and only you. Sakura lowered her head but did not say anything. Do you still want to protect them? She still did not say a word. You don't have to worry about Sukun or the worms he placed in your body, reassured Edward. It's not a problem to remove them or deal with him. How, do you know? 